ladies and gentlemen, please join us in welcoming our host for today, Mr. Kel Kalma Nakayang. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the symposium on the beginnings of European colonization of Southeast Asia. Brought to you by the Asia Japan Alumni International, the ASEAN Council of Japan Alumni, and the Philippine Federation of Japan Alumni. Today's symposium is all about discovery. By looking at the past, we will be able to discover more of ourselves, both as individuals and as societies, to understand why our societies are the way they are and what they value. We hope that today's symposium can help us to feel a connection with the past as we discover that some human experiences are universal across time. So understanding the linkages between past and present is absolutely basic for a good understanding of the condition of being human. To formally open today's symposium, we will be joined by distinguished guests who will now deliver their welcome remarks in the order by which I will call them. We shall start with the President of the Philippine Federation of Japan Alumni, Ms. Cynthia Reyes, to be followed by the Chairman of ASEAN Council of Japan, Ascoja, Mr. Yi Jen In. Next would be the Chairman of Asia Japan Alumni International, ASJA, Mr. Gian Yishen, to be followed by the Honorable Ambassador of Japan to the Philippines. His Excellency Kazuhiko Koshikawa. And last but not the least, the Minister of Finance of Japan, Honorable Shunichi Suzuki, who is concurrently the President of the Parliamentarians Association for Ascoja and Astia. His message will be read by Ambassador Wotaro Ogawa, Astia International Director for Japan. Ms. Cynthia Reyes, you now have the floor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I'm pleased to welcome you to the symposium on the beginnings of European colonization of Southeast Asia. To the Honorable Kazuhiko Koshikawa, Ambassador of Japan to the Philippines, Mr. Yi Jen En, the Chairman of the ASEAN Council of Japan Alumni, Mr. Jian Yi Xian, the Chairman of the ASEAN Asia Japan Alumni International, or ASJA, Mr. Suzuki Shuniki, as Suzuki, President of Ascoja Asia Parliamentary Association and now Minister of Finance of Japan, Ambassador Gotaro Ogawa, Asia Director for Japan, our keynote speakers, Mr. Danilo Madrid Herona and the Reverend Father Renzo De Luca, SJ, Provincial of the Japan, Province of the Society of Jesus, and to the esteemed speakers, historians, academicians, and guests. Welcome to a great day of reminiscing our shared history over the last 500 years. For this year's symposium, given the ongoing pandemic that has shown how interdependent we are as a global community, it is timely that we look back and highlight the developments that have contributed to our respective national histories as well as our collective destiny as a region. A glance through the list of presentations planned for the day reveals the amazing diversity of our cultural, heritage, influences, and histories, the understanding of which are critical in order to foster close collaboration and cooperation amongst our nations. Ladies and gentlemen, a symposium such as this provides us not only with a valuable opportunity to revisit our past, but also to witness how historical developments have shaped our respective national identities. Moreover, a common understanding of our differences, commonalities, shared values, and goals will surely ensure a stronger ASEAN. I am grateful to the many experts who have taken time out to be here to share their knowledge with us today. I also welcome the many guests from governments, alumni societies, and the academy have joined us. I look forward to the fruitful and rewarding exchanges amongst the participants, and I wish all of us a truly successful and enlightening symposium. Thank you very much.
immediate past president of Jugas. Thank you for taking the time off this Saturday morning to be here with us for this very interesting Asja Asphodia Symposium under the theme of the beginning of European colonization of Southeast Asia. On behalf of Ascoja, I would like to congratulate Tilfeja for organizing this very meaningful symposium during these trying times. At the same time, I'm heartened to see the strong interest from the various chapters and our partners from Japan to participate and contribute to the discussions around this theme. Equally impressive is the lineup of academically stimulating and thought-provoking keynotes and presentations by experts and scholars from the region. ASEAN is a huge and very diverse region with many ethnicity, languages, and religion across the 10 ASEAN countries. Detractors will point to these vast differences as re reasons why ASEAN's effort towards coming together to form closer economic, political, and social cooperations are bound to fail. However, for those who believe in the ASEAN vision, we see strength in our shared heritage within our diversity that can ultimately help to bring us closer together. The collective experience of ASEAN country under Western colonial influence and subjugation over the past 300 plus years is one such shared heritage. It is fair to say that the experience of the Western colonization has greatly shaped the worldview of the respective ASEAN countries to this day. Therefore, true to the slogan of the symposium, a look into the past to discover more of ourselves. It is meaningful and important for us to understand the historical perspective of our neighbors in the context of Western colonization and how history can influence the way the different nations in ASEAN see the geopolitics of the present day and into the future to come. I look forward to a day of lively and open discussion on this very interesting topic. Once again, I'd like to thank Tilfeja and Asja for making this symposium possible. Thank you very much and have a great day ahead. His Excellency Kazuhito Koshikawa, Ambassador of Japan to the Philippines, the Honorable Shunichi Suzuki, President of the Parliamentary Association for Askoja and Asja, concurrently the Minister of Finance of Japan. I hope everyone is staying healthy and well. I'm very happy to join all of you here today, virtually. I think we have been repeating this for the last two years by now. Um, just a word on, on, on what's happening globally. I'm very glad to see vaccinations uh, progressing everywhere. And as well as regionally, um, Singapore is also starting to open up to many more vaccinated visitors. Just last week, we had a mad rush to Singapore Airlines when our prime minister announced that we will allow vaccinated travel lanes to nine new countries without quarantines. So I think there is some form of return to normalcy. But that said, um, I just read uh, an article a few days ago, which pointed out that we have evolved from a COVID-19 crisis into a COVID-19 era. A crisis implies that it's short term and everything will return to normal after a while. But I think an, uh, the, the phrase of using a COVID-19 era implies a much deeper transformation for everyone in society. There will be likely permanent changes and greater online digital interactions such as this symposium is likely to be one of them. And in many ways, I think it's a positive change. After the Aska, Asja Askoja International Symposium held by Jugas in Singapore, uh, Singapore which was the which was held online uh, for the first time uh, in March this year. I'm glad to see that this is followed up by Filfeja in this 18th Asja Askoja International Symposium on the beginnings of European colonization in Southeast Asia. I'm sure we will learn of many new perspectives about our history and culture that has been so intertwined with colonization. 
I won't dwell on this topic as I'm sure our speakers will do a much better job on than me on, on how this is important for us to understand and, and learn as we move forward. Back to the topic of online symposiums. Online symposiums have, have a very different character. There's much less interaction, but it also has much less barriers to participation given that we don't have to travel to join such symposiums. And we can have much more opportunity to keep records of such interactions. Uh, but what we need to do oftentimes is to translate these online interactions into more permanent linkages amongst our members and audience. As a body of alumni with strong links to Japan, we need to play a crucial role in not just working with Japan, but also for Japan in providing different perspectives to Japan and explaining the Japanese perspective regionally. Japan and ASEAN are facing great political changes that require all of us to have greater understanding of different perspectives and be much more linked with each other, without which the risk of misunderstanding and conflict will be greatly increased. Given the need, in many ways, I feel that creating greater linkages amongst members, especially digitally, would be very, very critical, especially for a group like Asja Askoja. I hope that as part of our next stage of development for Asja Askoja, we should we will give greater emphasis on building digital platforms that will allow these digital connections to flourish. That said, digital connections cannot be the only network or the aim of our grouping. Physical interactions will continue to be important. I do hope that some of our physical events, including more physical symposium gatherings and the Asja, Askoja conference can return soon. All of these efforts and activities which we treasure would not be possible without the strong financial and organizational support of MOFA. I would like to take this opportunity to thank MOFA for the strong support all through the years. Finally, I would like to congratulate Phil Feja for organizing this symposium amidst the continued COVID-19 era. And I would like to wish all participants a good symposium on this fascinating topic. Thank you. Mr. Jian Yi Shen, Ms. Sincia Reyes, Dr. Danilo Madolit Gerona, Father Lenzo De Luca, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Magandang alaw po sa inyong lahat. Minasan konnichiwa. First and foremost, I'd like to take a moment to express my gratitude for the invitation to join all of you today. I'm truly honored to be in your company as we share a precious time. May this virtual symposium become an exciting space for meaningful discussion. Congratulations to the Philippine Federation of Japan Alumni and Asia Japan Alumni for making this event possible. The pandemic built new challenges for all of us, but today, you have proven that human innovation is powerful. We are always proud to see our alumni lead their respective disciplines and today our outstanding achievement. Today we will explore the rich tapestry of our shared history, the 500th anniversary of first circumnavigation of the world is a critical juncture in the world history especially for the Philippines. Its legacy threads multiple perspectives for exploration. We are fortunate to have some of the brightest thinkers to share with us perspectives on this milestone that shaped the world. As a diplomat, our symposium today excites me as it presents an interesting take on our country's long friendship. The first circumnavigation of the world plays a historical significance for our current state of good relations. In Japan, the expedition to circumnavigate the world falls timely with many significant moments in our history, like the Philippines. 
Europeans began coming to Japan during the warring state period in the 16th century when the daimyo of feudal lord are competing to unify Japan. During this period, Japanese encountered traders and missionaries from Spain and Portugal. The introduction of new technologies and ideas ushered in the rich cultural exchange between Japan and Europe. It also opened the trade between Japan and Luzon, one of the important trading ports in the region. The growth of Christianity paved the way for the Japanese to voyage Europe. The arrival of Tensho Boy's mission to meet the Pope and kings of Spain and Portugal introduced Japan to the European region. This was later followed by the Hasekura Tsunenaga's mission to Spain and the Vatican spirited the presence of Japan in the world. However, changes in Japanese society emerged when by the time this expedition returned. The influence of Christianity in Japan sparked fears of domination among the rulers of the time. The Tokugawa shogunate banned Christianity and led to a policy of isolationism in the 17th century. These changes prompted daimyo Justo Takayama Ukon to exile into Manila, where he lived a life of holiness until his death. The Saka navigation of the world highlights the unique intersection of our histories. Beyond the 65 years of friendship between Japan and the Philippines, our experience suggests the depths of our ties. It might sound far-fetched, but this segment in history intertwines us closer. The linkage enriches our friendship and strengthens us further. May our centuries of relations propel our nation to more meaningful collaboration. As we move forward to 65 years, 500 years and beyond, may the partnership that build our bilateral relations flourish as our histories unite us close. Mabu Hai and Maramin Salamapo. Shunichi, Parliamentary Association of Ascoja, and President of the Parliamentary Association of Ascoja and Asuja. I would like to convey my warmest greetings to all those associated on the initiatives of creating a historic event entitled The Beginnings of European Colonization of Southeast Asia. This is the 18th Symposium of Asuja Ascoja and I am particularly pleased to welcome all the participants present here today. It is unfortunate that we are unable to gather together for this symposium, but despite the challenges, Asuja and Ascoja have maintained their support and partnership with Philfasia to ensure the success of this event. I would especially like to congratulate Philfasia who was successful in being selected to host this event. I believe that this symposium will become a valuable platform for promoting collaborations and sharing of insights from the experts and distinguished historians in the ASEAN. This symposium reminds us all of the importance of inclusivity and of fully respecting different perspectives and identities. I wish you every success with your undertakings, which I am sure you will see much fruitful collaborations. I hope that this will contribute to the development of awareness of our historical background and encourage the participants towards gaining and spreading this valuable knowledge. President of the Parliamentary Association for Ascoja and Asuja, Suzuki Shiroichi. Thank you so much, Ms. Cynthia Reyes, Mr. Yi Zhen En, Mr. Gyan Yin Shen, 
the Honorable Ambassador Kazuhiko Koshikawa, Minister Shunichi Suzuki, who is represented by Honorable Ambassador Gotaro Ugawa, for being in the front, forefront of this very engaging and informative event. And now, to set the tone for today's symposium, which is really about men of courage who have crossed vast seas to reach our region and thus influence our histories. Please join me in welcoming four performers who have all sang lead as well as supporting roles in operas. Ms. Ana Migalios, Ms. Ayona Ventusilla Borja, Mr. Raymond Yadao, and Mr. Carlos Falsis. Ms. Migalios trained at the UP College of Music and the Royal College of Music in London, while Ms. Borja and Mr. Falsis both trained in St. Scholastica's College of Music. Mr. Yadao, for his part, trained at the Pontifical University of Santo Tomas. Please join me in welcoming them as they sing for us first a song about envisioning a world of one's design. The song entitled A Million Dreams. Then a song about fighting the good fight against all odds. The song entitled Impossible Dream. And finally, a song about perseverance. The song entitled Climb Every Mountain. I close my eyes and I can see a world that's waiting up for me that I call my own. Through the dark, through the door, through where no one's been before, but it feels like home. They can say, they can say, it all sounds crazy. They can say, they can say, I've lost my mind. I don't care, I don't care, so call me crazy. We can live in a world that we design. Cause every night I lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me awake. I think of what the world could be, a vision of the one I see. A million dreams is all it's gonna take. Oh, a million dreams for the world we're gonna make. There's a house we can build. Every room inside is filled with things from far away. Special things I compile, each one there to make you smile on a rainy day. They can say, they can say, it all sounds crazy. They can say, they can say, we've lost a mind. I don't care, I don't care if they call us crazy. Run away to a world that we desire. Just every night I lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me awake. I think of what the world could be, a vision of the one I see. A million dreams is all it's gonna take. Close my eyes to see. Cause 
every night I lie in bed, the brightest colors fill my head. A million dreams are keeping me away. A million dreams, a million dreams. I think of what the world could be, a vision of the one I see. A million dreams is all it's gonna take. A million dreams for the world we're gonna live.
Analyzing historical events, context can help us understand what motivates people to behave as they did. Bearing this in mind, therefore, it is my privilege to introduce our two distinguished speakers for this morning. In the interest of time, please allow me to introduce both of them. First, an introduction of our second speaker to be followed by my introduction of the first speaker. Our second speaker this morning is currently the Provincial of the Japan Province of the Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits. It is indeed most appropriate that we hear from a Jesuit about his presentation on the clash between Japanese feudalism and European colonialism from the point of view of the Jesuit missionaries. For Christianity in Japan started in 1549 when St. Francis Xavier of the Society of Jesus arrived in Kagoshima and began the first Christian missionary activities in the country. Our speaker was born in Argentina and he entered the Society of Jesus in 1981. After undertaking his training at the Novitiate and Juniorate in Argentina, he was sent to Japan in 1985. Thereafter, he did two years of Japanese language studies at Sofia University in Tokyo and subsequently served at the Ofuna Church in Japan. A graduate of both the Faculty of Humanities, Philosophy Department, the Faculty of Theology of the Theology Department of the Sofia University in Tokyo, Japan, he was ordained a priest in 1996 and was then sent to Nagasaki to work mainly in Christian history research. He obtained his license in Japanese history from Kyushu University and thereafter since October 2004, became the director and curator of the 26 Martyrs Museum in Nagasaki, Japan, where he served until early 2017 when he was appointed provincial of the Japan province of the Society of Jesus. A prolific writer, he has published many works, among them, Balignano's Game for a Japanese Church, the Concept of Mission in the 16th Century in Japan, a comparative study of the styles of Jesuit mission reports Latin America and Japan, and a discerning Christian lord, Takayama Ukon, an update on the conflicts with the Wada and Araki families, among others. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very honored to have with us straight from Tokyo, Japan, the Reverend Father Renzo De Luca of the Society of Jesus, to share with us later on his views. For our first speaker, we have with us also this morning a noted historian who will share his insights about the European perspectives of Asia at the time of the Magellan Expedition, a most appropriate topic as we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Ferdinand Magellan in the Philippines, or what is officially referred to as the 500th anniversary of the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation of the world. He is currently the director of the Partido Study Center 
and the newly created Magellan Elcano Study Center at the Partido State University located in Tamarina Sur, the Philippines. An alumnus of both the Ateneo de Manila University where he finished his master's degree and the University of the Philippines where he obtained his PhD, our speaker has done extensive postgraduate research in various archives in the Philippines and in Europe, particularly in Spain, Portugal, and Italy, specializing in the early Spanish colonial history of the Philippines. He is the only Asian historian from among the 22 scholars who are invited from all over the world to contribute articles for inclusion in the recently published commemorative book of Spain's Ministry of Defense for the celebration of the 500th anniversary of the circumnavigation of the world. Aside from having delivered lectures in prestigious gatherings of scholars, such as the Universidad de Sevilla in Spain and in the Sociedad de Geografía de Lisboa in Portugal, he has likewise made presentations at a number of webinars organized by various academic and cultural institutions, both in the Philippines and abroad, on various topics regarding the early Spanish colonial period in the Philippines. As a prolific scholar, scholar he has published monographs and books on various topics in local and national histories, and the most important of these is the book, Ferdinand Magellan, Armada de Maluco, and the European Discovery of the Philippines, which is the first fully documented work on the subject written by a Filipino historian, earning for him the recognition as one of the leading scholars on Magellan history. In addition to being a historian, he's also into historical paintings, and in fact, has kindly allowed us to use one of his paintings, the departure of Magellan's fleet from the Atlantic coast, from the San Luca de, Lucar de Barameda in Cadiz, Spain, which you can now see on your screens for our flyer that announced this, this symposium. It is therefore my honor and privilege, ladies and gentlemen, to now turn over the floor to our distinguished first speaker, Dr. Danilo Madrid Herona. Dr. Herona, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Domingo, um, of course, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the organizers who, for giving me the honor to be invited as one of the uh, keynote speakers here. Um, I'd like to extend my uh, my um, greetings also to the President of the Philippine Federation of Japan Alumni, uh, Ms. Cynthia Reyes. Um, the Chairman of ASEAN Council of Japan, Mr. Yi Jianen. Uh, the Chairman of Asia Japan Alumni International, Mr. Jian Yi Hain Chin. And the Ambassador of Japan to the Philippines, Ambassador Kasuhiko Kushikawa. And the President of Ascoja Asia, uh, Asia Parliamentary Association, Mr. Shinichi Mizuki. I would like to talk about uh, the uh, European perspectives of Asia during the Magellan Expedition and to put it in the context of the theme, uh, I would also discuss the uh, Spanish conquest of the Philippines because the conquest of the Philippines in a way served as the springboard for the attempts of Spain to establish foothold in various parts of Asia, not only in the Philippines, but contrary to what we have always uh, been taught in history, that Spain was uh, in, uh, imperial interest was only confined to the Philippines, it was actually, uh, the Philippines was actually uh, only seen by Spain as a useful springboard for the, uh, for, uh, the expansion of her foothold in Asia as it proceeds to the other parts of uh, the, uh, of the, of the of Philippines, of, of, of Asia. Um, now, so let me now proceed. Can I now share screen? The first part, I'll talk about the inter cetera and the papal uh, division of the world. Okay? Uh, the first portion will dwell on the Portuguese East. Um, we have to understand that uh, the earliest uh, European powers that uh, entered the terrain of Southeast Asia were the Portuguese. And for that reason, to understand uh, the context of how 
um, the Europeans eventually acquired knowledge of Southeast Asia and of Asia in general, and also uh, how it eventually uh, inspired this, uh, the European powers to uh, eventually uh, enter into the terrain of uh, the Southeast Asian uh, territory is largely due to the fact that the Portuguese were among those who, who provided uh, the, the basic information on the early encounters of Europeans of, of Southeast Asia. So to begin with, as I said, uh, we have to understand the fact that while we are talking here of the knowledge of Southeast Asia or of Asia by the Europeans, in the 16th century, knowledge, as Foucault would always uh, uh, put it, is always power. And uh, for the Portuguese, the acquisition of substantial information of Southeast Asia constituted as a formidable basis for their uh, uh, um, drive to occupy and eventually expand their uh, control of Southeast Asia. And also, uh, which uh, invites other uh, foreign powers, other European powers, to uh, consider uh, in, um, uh, um, entering the, 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 the uh, domain of, uh, the, of Southeast Asia. And um, in fact, uh, just to put this in context, the idea of knowledge as associated with power in the 16th century, the word descubrimiento in the 16th century uh, Spanish does not simply mean a, uh, a the finding of a certain uh, place. That's precisely the reason why there were a lot of Filipinos, uh, in a way, complaining when historians would refer to Magellan's discovery of the Philippines because they said uh, there were already uh, natives in the Philippines, the Chinese were already here, and in fact the Japanese were already in, uh, engaged in commerce in, in the Philippines and, uh, and the Thais. In fact, when Magellan... Uh, back in the port of Cebu, there were already foreigners. And so the some Filipino nationalists uh, believe that the term discovery is inappropriate to describe the uh, landing of Magellan in the Philippines. And therefore, the celebration of uh, the coming of Magellan as a discovery is not, uh, not actually uh, considered as appropriate. But then we have to understand the fact that the word discovery in the 16th century Spain does not actually correspond to our understanding of discovery at present. Discobrimiento in the 16th century Spain refers not only to finding, it's not an epistemological concept that one finds something because it is always tied up with a certain colonialist uh, implication. Discobrimiento in the 16th century uh, Spanish means that one finds something but the thing would be considered for colonization later. So generally, the word discoverment is associated with, with places, with lands, because of the potential uh, uh, um, plan to uh, engage the territory as part of the imperial realm. So to begin with, uh, I'd like to proceed to the discussion of the inter cetera and the papal division of the world. Can we proceed to to the next slide, please. Of course, most of us are familiar with the inter cetera bull, and uh, because of its landmark implication in the intrusion of the European powers in Southeast Asia. We have to understand that the inter cetera bull uh, issued in 1493 in the wake of the Spanish discovery of America was actually a part of a millions of bulls issued way back in the early part of the uh, in the first half of the 15th century, as early as 15 uh, of, as early as 1454, uh, and when a certain bull was issued because of the recognition of Vatican of, 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 of the Pope of the contribution of the Portuguese in their efforts to bring about the faith in uh, Africa and in and eventually in the uh, in the in 
other parts of the, uh, the kingdoms of, uh, in Africa. And for that reason, the, uh, the Pope conferred a legitimacy on the incursion of Portugal in South, in, uh, in Africa, and eventually in the other parts of what we know as the Portuguese East. So the Intertiator Rabun opened a floodgate of interest for not only for Africa but for other parts of, uh, of Asia. The Intertiator Rabun, as we know, divided the world into two. Uh, the, it laid the demarcation line um, in 1493, which uh, says that 100 leagues west of the Azores would fall on the uh, on Spain and the eastern part would fall on the, the Portuguese. So, uh, but then it has to be clarified because eventually in the, in the later part of the 16th century, in 1560s, the issue cropped up once again. Uh, how does this bull actually define the colonial enterprise in the context of uh, Spain and Portugal? Does this mean that the, uh, that the, the Vatican, that, uh, the, the Pope, conferred and legitimize uh, colonization, the imperial inclusion in various parts of, of Asia and various parts of the world because of the intergenerable rule. It has to be clarified. In fact, um, in the 16th century, I said it cropped up once again that the, the intergenerable rule primarily conferred upon these European powers the access to these territories for purposes of evangelization. That's the main purpose of the uh, papal bulls and, and of course uh, the inter cetera, that it would allow uh, passage and in fact occupation of the Portuguese to the east and the uh, Spaniards to the west to bring about the conversion of these heathen people and bring them under the fold of the faith. So that's essentially how it legitimized the incursion of the uh, Portuguese to the east and eventually expanded until Malacca in 1510. And from 1492, uh, Spain eventually uh, settled in America, but an attempt during the time of Magellan to expand the domain of uh, the Spaniards to the Western group eventually uh, brought into the core their interest on the Spice Islands. That's precisely, uh, that's one that is very, very important in considering uh, the coming of the Europeans in Southeast Asia. The other thing is we uh, is the, the Portuguese conquest and European knowledge of Southeast Asia. From 1487, when uh, the Portuguese eventually went down to the southern tip of Africa, Cape of Good Hope, and eventually proceeded on an eastern route, uh, this eventually uh, uh, encountering uh, uh, Caligot India in 1497 and eventually and a few years after by 1510 um, Portugal was already proceeding downward to Malacca and established their foothold in Malacca. So with the Cantas of Malacca uh, the Portuguese was introduced into a vast domain of Southeast Asia particularly the Spice Islands. Um, in, in 1510, while they were based in um, Malacca, there were in fact um, reports of series of expeditions sent by the Portuguese eastward because earlier on there were the, uh, the Europeans believed that much of the spices in Asia were actually found were actually produced in Malacca and sent to India and spread to the rest of, uh, of uh, the Middle East and off to um, Europe. But then, while they were based in uh, in Malacca, they learned that the main source of the course of the spices were in the Spice Island and so-called as what the Spanish language as the Especeria and, uh, and the Moluccas and the group of islands in the Moluccas. And so, a uh, series of expeditions were sent to explore further and learn more about this uh, uh, cluster of islands which produce the highly prized uh, spices uh, uh, among the Europeans. 
And in the course of their expeditions, not only that they settled, not only that they were able to discover uh, uh, more of uh, information on uh, the Spice Islands, but they even there were even reports uh, from royal chroniclers that some of the expeditions, in fact, as early as 1510, 1511, uh, had reached uh, as far as the Philippines. And uh, because of these informations of expanding knowledge of Southeast Asia, a number of Portuguese chroniclers started writing about Southeast Asia. Of course, the knowledge of Southeast Asia did not begin with the uh, Portuguese in the uh, port in the 15th and the uh, 16th century. As early as the 13th century, uh, a number of uh, Europeans, in fact, uh, the, the Italians, were already writing about uh, Southeast Asia. For example, we have uh, Marco Polo and we have Fray Odori, an Italian Franciscan, who was said to have um, not only uh, visited, uh, not only um, 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 went around Southeast Asia, but there was, in fact, in the Philippines, it became a major issue on when we were uh, started to, starting to, to, to plan out for the 500-year celebration of the, of the Magellan uh, landing in the Philippines because of the issue of the first mass. In fact, uh, the, the, the controversy in the Philippines uh, came up with the issue of where was the site of the first mass, uh, uh, Limasawa or Butuan. Another issue, another issue about the first mass service, and says it a much earlier mass was celebrated as early as 13, as the uh, second decades or the first decades of the 13th of the 14th century was supposed to have been celebrated in Bulinao. So it was on the medieval age, uh, uh, more than uh, uh, 200 years earlier than the 1521 mass in the Philippines, and it says that the mass was celebrated because of Fray uh, Odori. Uh, an Italian Franciscan who was uh, stranded in Bulinao in the course of a certain typhoon uh, while he was proceeding to uh, Japan or uh, or China in that particular uh, respective uh, plan of prior uh, Odori. So there were earlier accounts on Southeast Asia written by Italians, but they but more expanded, might say, uh, knowledge of Southeast Asia came out by the, uh, uh, the early part of the uh, 16th century, particularly through the works of two Portuguese uh, chroniclers. Uh, one of them was uh, Tommy Perez, who eventually became an ambassador in 15, uh, 1515 to China, but apparently never returned. Uh, it is suspected by historians that he died in China. Uh, and we know from uh, Tommy Perez, who was a who was an apothecary, was a, 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 a merchant engaged in drugs uh, from, taken from Southeast Asia because of the uh, enormous interest on the exotic products of Southeast Asia, particularly not only spices but but on the uh, drugs available in uh, various parts of Southeast Asia. In the course of his travels in various parts of Southeast Asia. Um, Tommy Paris had written a compendium, sort of an almanac of Southeast Asia, from um, which covered their journey of the Portuguese from um, Lisbon until uh, Malacca, where he eventually established his base and apparently where he wrote his chronicle on uh, Southeast Asia. And the information provided by Tommy Paris were tremendous uh, value for um, subsequent explorers. In fact, most probably even Magellan, uh, when it was published um, around 1515 in that particular period. So, we, we, uh, Tommy Perez was, of course, one of the most important uh, chroniclers, uh, uh, Portuguese chroniclers that we have in the 16th century. But aside from him, there was another major um, contributors to the knowledge of uh, Southeast Asia from the point of view of the Portuguese. And this was Duarte Barbosa. Here are the books of, uh, written by these two. Duarte Barbosa is another interesting character. Um, 
um, in the history, in the annals of, uh, of, of, uh, of Southeast Asia history. Duarte Barbosa until today remains to be a, uh, a mysterious character. We don't really know who Duarte Barbosa was until the present time because it appears that historically there were two Duarte Barbosas that came out in history and which one was the chronicler. One group of historians believe that there was only one Duarte Barbosa. Uh, this is one school of thought. The Duarte Barbosa who wrote this uh, chronicle of Southeast Asia, who was a, a scribal, was described in Portuguese records, <laughs> was actually the same Duarte Barbosa who joined the Bajanan expedition in 1519 and survived the expedition and uh, and uh, settled uh, stayed in uh, joined Magellan until uh, Cebu but eventually was among those massacred in Cebu uh, when the natives uh, um, um, held a banquet and invited the Spaniards and massacred them in the process so Duarte Barbosa was supposed to be there were as I said two Duarte Barbosas, uh, uh, the other school of thought says that aside from this uh, Duarte Barbosa who was the scribal, there was the he was probably the same Duarte Barbosa who joined the Magellan expedition as one as, uh, as a group of historians uh, believe that uh, apparently uh, based on his uh, journey from uh, Lisbon as uh, as a merchant as one engaged in uh, in uh, trade and also as one working uh, under uh, certain uh, Portuguese businessmen, he must have acquired substantial information and uh, in the course of his journey and therefore wrote down this particular uh, narrative. But he must have joined the Magellan expedition. In fact, there was the belief that this Duarte Barbosa could have been a brother-in-law of uh, Ferdinand Magellan. And so he joined the Magellan expedition and uh, reached as far as uh, the Philippines. But uh, based on the available uh, documents in the Archivo General de Indias, a little information on Barbosa suggests that he seemed to be a, quite an irresponsible uh, young man. Uh, he was a literous fellow. And in fact, Magellan had uh, had um, uh, castigated him for several times for violating his rules when they were still in South America, uh, at forbidding them to go out and uh, mingle with the natives. But this guy was said to be engaging in cer certain kind of a sexual affairs with the natives of South America in violation of Magellan's prohibition because of the fear of uh, possible. Uh, Mur mur uh, killing them by the natives and when he reached Cebu the same act uh, the same violation was committed by Duarte Barbosa so could he be the same person who wrote this book because it appears that uh, the writing of the book demands certain kind of uh, quality and virtue of responsibility and commitment so the other schools of thoughts uh, doubted whether he was the same scribal or author of this particular book. There were, therefore, there seems to be a belief that there were actually two Duarte Barbosa. The one, one was the scribal and the one who authored these uh, chronicles on Southeast Asia, and the other was a Duarte Barbosa, the brother-in-law, or sometimes they say the cousin of Magellan, uh, who joined the Magellan expedition and died in Cebu. So, uh, we don't really know, but the whole point in this discussion is that these works of Tommy Perez and the work of Duarte Barbosa provided us as a comprehensive information on uh, uh, the 16th century Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, the, because of the works of these two uh, chroniclers, Tommy Perez and Duarte Barbosa, 
we are able to uh, obtain substantive information and uh, virtually a comprehensive uh, knowledge of Southeast Asia. Um, some of the some of the informations provided, aside from the geographical details uh, uh, that they provided on the various kingdoms and various settlements located most likely in um, in the coast of um, these uh, territories, Africa, India, and the and Malacca. Um, the, the, the very very rich information about uh, politics, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, rulers that they have, the kings, their uh, the certain um, 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 unusual, you, know, you say peculiarities that uh, that uh, prevail in the culture of these people. Uh, in a way, provided very very interesting. Uh, stories on folk tales, I might say, uh, stuff for producing myths and legends. In fact, one of the legends perpetuated in the works of these two were, was actually uh, the legend of Mr. John, uh, a legendary figure that had been a um, uh, major stock of stories, of medieval stories, I might say. And uh, until the 15th century, uh, there were stories, in fact, uh, still recorded by, I think, uh, Tony Perez or Duarte Barbosa, which still mentioned at a certain Prester John, uh, uh, um, a Christian leader uh, in uh, Africa, in some kingdoms in Africa. And other stories, uh, as I said, are very, very interesting informations that uh, would constitute uh, legends uh, that uh, became, uh, you might say, of, of, of interest to Europeans because of the uh, peculiar uh, culture, particularly uh, the, the practice of cannibalism in Southeast Asia. Uh, the mention of, uh, for example, uh, uh, one of these uh, chroniclers, I think there is mention of uh, certain practices in Southeast Asia of myriad of people, of their, uh, you might say, uh, relatives when they died, especially those who have uh, very, very important uh, social standing in the community. When they died, they were not actually buried. They were actually roasted. And they said they were actually eating them, uh, just like we eat the chon in the Philippines. So they were roasting them, they were eating them, because they said, if you love somebody and you have somebody who's very, very important, you don't allow the body to be, to be, to be, uh, to be corrupted by, by, the, by the soil. The best place for the, for the body of that important person to repose would be to another body of his relatives. And that's the reason why they eat the body of these, uh, of these uh, uh, relatives. And of course, these are quite of interest to many Europeans, uh, suggesting uh, the exotic culture, you might say, and the, you might uh, probably say the, uh, the barbaric character, the hidden characters, uh, the primitive nature of certain cultural traits of the Asians uh, in the eyes of the Europeans, which of course some historians would say uh, a useful fiction to a certain degree because it justifies the incursion of Asians and even the, the, uh, the, the project of the Europeans to convert them to Christianity and also to introduce what they considered as a form of civilization, uh, freeing them from these barbaric practices. So. Other than that, there are more serious informations which eventually became useful to uh, subsequent uh, foreign powers uh, for as, a, uh, as, a, as a basic information to understand Southeast Asia and also as uh, inspirations for them, to, which attracted them, which, uh, which uh, attracted them to eventually um, entered and also put their stake in Southeast Asian territories. Among them, of course, would be the, the religion of Southeast Asia. So uh, Perez and Duarte Barbosa uh, provided uh, profound and uh, extensive information on the religions of uh, Southeast Asia, particularly talking about the, 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 uh, the hidden practices and also of the two uh, major religious, um, uh, major religious uh, ideologies, Hinduism and, uh, uh, and Buddhism, um, sorry, Hinduism, Buddhism, and uh, Islam. 
And this knowledge of, uh, of the religions would eventually play a crucial role, not only for the Portuguese, but also for the Spaniards to consider um, um, conquering portions of Southeast um, Asia. Okay. So, can we proceed to the next slide, please? Another important source of information provided by the Portuguese was the globe of uh, Martin Behind. Um, Behind's globe, in a way, provided a picture. It enabled the Europeans to obtain a graphic image of how Southeast Asia looked like. As you can see, it mentioned here of Katai, of China, of course, and it mentioned here of Sipang was early as 1492. Um, the Europeans were already familiar of the existence of uh, Japan uh, as a major uh, civilizations and of China and of other clusters of islands in the Southeast Asian territory, in particularly the Spice Islands, because of the interest that it generated in terms of uh, the spices. And as I said, uh, precisely, that's another point that... Uh, made the works of Tony Perez and um, Duarte Barbosa for Europeans, for subsequent uh, Europeans who would take interest in Southeast Asia because of the detailed information they provided on the variety of wealth found in Southeast Asia, aside from the spices in the Spiceria, in the Moluccas. They also provided details on the treasures the uh, minerals, the, the drugs that were available in the various parts of Southeast Asia. And Martin B. Heinz Globe in this particular context is essential because, as I said, it provided them a more graphic image of how Southeast Asia looked like and how extensive was the uh, landscape, so to speak. Yeah, in the midst of this uh, oceanic space uh, that Southeast Asia had and um, therefore uh, served as a useful guide, in particular to navigators. In the midst of all this information, as I said, the Portuguese were among the pioneers in compiling data on Southeast Asia. Another important person, which of course played a crucial role in the history of the Philippines, was also a part of this, who shared certain information even before 1521. He was Bernal Magalhaes or Ferdinand Magellan. Contrary to what most people thought that Magellan came to the Philippines only in 1521, Magellan had been in Southeast Asia as early as 15, uh, 1510. Uh, he was in uh, Malacca. He was among those soldiers, in fact, a captain already, in the taking of Malacca. He was stationed in India as early as, I think, 1505. And from India, he was uh, eventually joined the expedition of Albuquerque and went to uh, Malacca and the taking uh, in the Battle of Malacca. And uh, staying there about a year, Magellan was said to have joined a certain expedition which was organized by a number of captains and believed to be an illegitimate expedition because it has no sanction from King Manuel uh, at the time of Portugal. And they explored, they moved east and explored that cluster of islands in the Moluccas, in the Sicilias. And out of that, it is said that an expedition, one of these ships, uh, this uh, group, eventually proceeded as far as the Philippines. And uh, one royal chronicler, in fact, uh, in the Spanish court, affirmed that Magellan must have reached the Philippines as early as 1512, long before he uh, landed in the Philippines in 1521. So there were, Magellan apparently acquired substantial knowledge of Southeast Asia 
while he was in Malacca. Um, in fact, it is most likely that Magellan was not only introduced into the Malaccan society, but he must have introduced into the base Southeast Asian societies because Malacca was a major trading outpost in the 16th century. And in fact, a number of traders, yeah, Chinese, Japanese, Muslimi, the, the Thais, had established their foothold in the markets of uh, Malacca. And among those who were in the Malaccan market, engaged in the uh, vibrant trade in Malacca, were a group of people described by Tome Perez as the Lozoes or the Luzon people. And then uh, the, uh, um, Paris gave a brief description of these Luzones uh, or these Luzones uh, who were coming to Malacca almost every year and they were bringing their trades and they, they were um, they were engaged in the, in the trade of, 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 of Malacca and they to be quite an important uh, people in the Malaccan society. In fact, one of the so-called Luzones or Luzones uh, was in fact appointed as a savandar by uh, the king of Malacca, uh, sort of a market supervisor at that time, and apparently uh, indicating the importance shown to these people of the zone by the uh, by the king of Malacca. So Magellan must have interacted uh, with these people and get a substantial knowledge not only of Malaccan society of the, the Spice Islands, but also of the Philippines. And he must have learned of the Philippines, as I said, in the Malacca, in Malacca as early as 1511, before he embarked on uh, on this expedition in 1519 to the Philippines. And because of his presence in Malacca, uh, Magellan even had uh, acquired slaves, which in a way deepened further his knowledge of Southeast Asia and uh, the Philippines, uh, one of, uh, at least two of them were mentioned, a woman from Sumatra, uh, who was supposed to be a very, very knowledgeable woman, uh, he brought uh, them to Lisbon, and another one was a man who eventually earned a very, very prominent name in world history, the so-called Enrique de Malacca, the native uh, Malaccan slave of Magellan, who serve as the interpreter of the Magellan expedition when they reach the Philippines. So this particular information that written by this uh, by uh, the, uh, the Portuguese uh, Escribao, uh, Duarte Barbosa, and the uh, Portuguese apothecary, uh, Tommy Perez, as well as Magellan's exposure to the Malaccan society and to his alleged travel to the Philippines must have greatly uh, widened the, the horizon of the Magellan's, uh, Magellan's knowledge of Southeast Asia and therefore prepared him and enticed him in a way to uh, transfer his allegiance from Portugal to Spain. So can we now proceed to the next slide to discuss the Magellan's uh, role in Southeast Asian uh, colonization, discovery, knowledge, and uh, colonization. The next slide. Thank you. Magellan and the Spanish imperialist interest in Southeast Asia. As I have said earlier, that Magellan already had a knowledge of, you might have Southeast Asia because of his presence in Malacca, he was stationed in India, and his travels in uh, the Moluccas and even as far as the Philippines, provided Magellan with extensive knowledge of uh, South Asia. And so when he decided to transfer to Spain, the reason apparently, some historians, you might probably ask, why did Magellan transfer his Alibar? Some historians, you uh, might probably ask, why did Magellan transfer his liberty? Some historians, you might ask, why did Magellan transfer his liberty? Because of the fact that there was a certain quarrel that erupted between him and King Manuel. One of the reasons that the quarrel is because Magellan wanted to be uh, indemnified uh, 
um, um, his wounds, um, his, um, the, the wounds incurred in the battle in North Africa, but which King Emmanuel refused. Instead of giving him some kind of uh, benefits for these wounds, he was in fact accused of stealing cows, uh, corruption, because it was said that he was the quarter master and he was in charge of, of uh, uh, appropriating and uh, uh, recording a certain war booty in the battles in North Africa, but he said he was accused of uh, selling uh, these cows, of, I think 2,000 tons of cows, and, would not, and did not account them to, to the royal uh, treasury. And for that reason, he was severely castigated by, uh, by, uh, by King Manuel of Portugal. And the other reason they some historians uh, su suspected was because Magellan and some of these captains made an illegal journey to the, the, the east without any uh, permission from the king. At the time, for us, it sounds very, very right and very, very trivial for us. But then at the time, um, knowledge, is, as I said, is very, very important. Uh, these are secret informations that should first go to the king before it should, uh, it should uh, be it should, uh, because of the fear that it might eventually be leaked out to the uh, the other to the competitors of Portugal, Spain, for that matter, and therefore because they conducted an illegal travel to a place very very important for Portugal because it was the uh, the source of spices, and the king was not pleased about what Madela did, and it is said that this was another possible reason why. The relationship between uh, King Manuel of Portugal and Magellan became sour, and eventually pushed Magellan to leave Portugal and sell the idea to uh, King Charles. And Charles, in a way, was apparently looking for this opportunity because of the fact that um, the Magellan's offer to proceed beyond the bounds of the American continent would assert their uh, territorial rights on the on the west uh, and the 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 extreme portion of um, the Portuguese territory that they had at that time was only Malacca and the fear that eventually Portugal would claim their control of the Moluccas of the Spice Islands was something that Charles would not entertain. Uh, uh, being realized by Portugal. And for that reason, when Magellan presented the idea that the Spice Islands belong to uh, Spain by virtue of this uh, inter rule and the Treaty of Tordesillas, then Charles was, the, the, the interest of Charles was fired. And for that reason, Charles readily uh, agreed to the proposal uh, Magellan. Of course, um, Magellan had presented a number of, in, of convincing evidence that the Spice Islands belong to Spain. And uh, by colonizing, by controlling the Spice Islands, in a way, it would prevent, it would preempt, in a way, uh, Portugal's annexation of the Spice Islands. And, and because, of, and as I said, Magellan presented a substantial, I might say, uh, believable evidence uh, uh, that it belongs to, to Spain. One of them would be the, 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 the slaves see, that Magellan dragged along in their meetings with the, with the, uh, with the council of, 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 uh, of Charles uh, to persuade them that these natives live in this territory, Sumatra and Malacca, and they were familiar with the geography of the territory. And also because he presented a number of correspondence uh, from his friend Francisco Sirao, who was based in the in the Moluccas, and was uh, telling them that it actually belonged to uh, Spain and it contained a lot of uh, very very rich uh, um, source of, of uh, sources of spices and other uh, treasures, which are not available in the in the European markets, and therefore. Would uh, would be a very very profitable enterprise if they would uh, eventually settle in this particular territory. The other thing is what 
made charts in a way readily. Surprise, I, 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 anybody who's familiar with the history of the, of the development of the Magellan expeditions would be surprised how Charles readily uh, accepted the proposal when Charles ascended the throne in 1517, few months after Magellan came, and by 1518, a contract was already signed between Portugal, between uh, Charles and Magellan. And as I said, see how quickly this uh, this uh, proposal of Magellan prospered. And apparently, because despite the ignorance of Charles of this uh, of this uh, of the, the politics at the time of the uh, 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 or the geography, even the knowledge of Southeast Asia, and even of the uh, the Spanish culture, because Charles was not actually uh, uh, culturally uh, immersed in the Spanish uh, in the Spanish culture, because he was uh, he was uh, German in, in, in orientation. In a way, provoked certain kind of a, of a, of a question: Why did Charles readily? Be uh, accept, accept the Magellan's uh, or uh, accept Magellan's uh, proposal, and as I said, because of several reasons, as I said, uh, the idea that they would be uh, controlling a very very important sorts of uh, commodity, uh, the spices, which uh, of course was in right greatly in demand in uh, Europe at the time, and also because it would realize certain kind of a uh, kind of a. Uh, Messianic vision, because like some historians would refer to it, uh, on the part of, uh, of Charles, this idea of extending the vista from the uh, from Europe to Southeast Asia. Of course, they there were no Moors in the American continent, but the reports that they gathered from the chronicles of Tommy Perez, Duarte Barbosa, and even the personal accounts of Ferdinand Magellan and his slaves show that the, it was an opportunity for Charles to realize a pious vision by extending the conquista to Southeast Asia. And also, at the same time, to realize what his advisor, Mercurino Gatinara had been play, had been toying with this ideology, this idea of a Pacific universal monarchy. Mercurino Gatinara had been telling Charles that apparently all signs showed that Charles was actually chosen by God for a certain purpose to bring about to unify the world under the mantle of Christianity but and to be realized and to bring about justice not only to spread the faith but to render to bring about a just society through the so-called Pacific Universal Monarchy and this is and these are some of the major concepts which could have compelled Charles to readily accede to Magellan and realize that Southeast Asia is an opportune place for him to colonize, to establish the good of in the world. And was there real, was there any evidence in some way that the Magellan expedition, which was eventually launched in 1519, was bent on bringing about the control of certain parts of Southeast Asia. The memorial of Magellan, for example, that there was a certain memorial uh, written by Magellan and turned over to King Charles a uh, few months before the expedition uh, departed in San Luca de Barameda in Spain. And it says there that Magellan was very, very clear about the destination of the Magellan expedition. Far from what most Filipinos and some historians thought that the expedition was actually bound for the Philippines. That's not actually true. Although it would be considered that Magellan was of narratives of the Philippines, but definitely Charles would not have any knowledge of that unless probably Magellan revealed the existence of certain clusters of islands which we now call as the Philippines. But then what Magellan 
had presented to Charles for the, the destination of the expedition was actually the Spice Island. So, in one of the documents in the Archivo General of the Indias in Seville, it mentions there categorically that Magellan was actually bound for the Moluccas, not for the Philippines, not for any other islands, but for the Moluccas. In fact, Magellan provided a brief geographic description of the Moluccas, where they were bound to. So it was intending for Moluccas. As I said, the reason is because Moluccas would be the last, last, the, the last uh, cluster of islands beyond Malacca. And as I said, Portugal was eyeing on controlling the Moluccas. And to preempt that, they would send, the Spain would be sending an expedition, and this was the Magellan expedition. Not only that, it would preempt the expansion of the Portuguese eastward, as the as Spain believed they rightly claim uh, that they have a rightful claim to these uh, to the Spice Islands, but it also controlled it would also enable them to uh, secure control of the very very valuable trade, uh, the Spice trade, and also as I said, uh, it would enable them to implement the vision of Charles of the Reconquista and the. Uh, Mercurino Gatinara's universal monarchy because of the presence of Moors. It was a Moorish territory and therefore for Charles it would be a great accomplishment on his part, on his highest vision if the Moors of Southeast Asia, particularly of the Moluccas, would be converted to Christianity. And as I said, was there any evidence that it was not simply an, an expedition to explore but to colonize, yes, the the cargo. Anybody who would do research on the because in the Archivo General the Indias, there's a substantial documents of very very detailed uh, records of the cargo of the Magellan expedition. It, um, it provided specific details on how many guns were carried, how many swords, uh, how many armors, uh, what food they were carrying, how many gallons of wine were carried by the fleet of the Magellan, it's, everything is there and it provided us as a very very interesting glimpse into the purpose of the Magellan expedition for the Moluccas. It was meant to settle in Moluccas. Why? Because the, the budget allocated by Charles for the expedition was not only for three months, was not only for four months, it was allocated for two years. So they in, that's the reason why the Magellan expedition, Charles and the royal uh, authorities were keen on provide on Magellan to provide a very very specific number of the members of the crew. So uh, at least the official record says 235. Some people, some record will say 250 or 260. The reason is because the the treasurers, the Spanish, the royal treasurer allocated for every individual a particular amount of provisions which will last for two years. That's precisely, and the reason why eventually uh, the expedition suffered certain starvation on the way was not only because they were delayed in South America, because apparently Magellan put in so an additional number of crew which had not been recorded in the royal treasury and therefore uh, created certain kind of problem in the distribution of food. But as I said, the, the, the allocation was for two years and that only shows that Charles was aware that the expedition would not only journey for a few months, this, of course they knew that uh, at least uh, in, in, uh, from Spain to America the expedition would, uh, any, the, any ships traveling from Spain to America would only be reckoned to travel by about a month and so if you add more uh, months to the uncertain space uh, that lies from America to the Spice Islands, probably it would not it would not uh, amount to two years. But then charts allocated uh, provisions for the expedition for two years, indicating that Charles was aware that the Magellan expedition would settle in the Spice Islands for a considerable number of months or even year. In fact, uh, 
some of the crew who applied for the expedition were not allowed to join the expedition because they were sent to wait for another expedition which would reinforce the Magellan expedition once they have already settled in a particular territory, in this particular case, the Mulukas. And uh, another evidence that it was intending to settle in Mulukas was, was because there, there was, was a certain instruction in the so-called Jones of the of, of, uh, of, uh, Charles to Magellan. But Charles issued 75 instructions to Magellan, but uh, apparently hardly known to many historians. Uh, in these instructions, Charles was telling Magellan to put certain kind of signs in the places where they made a landfall along their journey to ensure that the next would be able to see the route that they had taken and therefore follow other journeys. So these are interesting details which provide us um, very, very uh, uh, crucial information to uh, subsequent uh, expeditions and even to uh, the uh, Spaniards as to the uh, wealth of Southeast Asia. And this explains to us the reason why eventually Spain decided to uh, settle in the, the Spice Islands. But then, as I said, it's unfortunate because the expedition uh, suffered, suffered, suffered a failure, failure and they, they, they ran in the land in the accidentally. accidentally. And, uh, and for, that reason, uh, for that reason, in the tremendous, the tremendous hunger, hunger that the expedition of the expedition in, in the men of the Magera were already they were already they were already hungry eventually eventually captured Portuguese. by the Portuguese who already who already made established their days established their days particular territories and and that way in a way and then the Magellan expedition but the Magellan expedition though it failed to accomplish its purpose that of colonizing the spice islands it was also in a way provide us a certain glimpse into the certain uh, uh, trajectories of the Spanish policies on their colonization. One thing is, despite the fact that it was intending to establish a colonial foothold in the Lucas, Spain apparently made use more of diplomacy rather than of coercion. You have to understand that the Spanish, the Magellan expedition was the first experiment on diplomacy by Spain because of their very, very painful lessons from South America that if you use force, it would also encourage the natives to employ force in resisting colonial intervention. But here, by looking at the cargo itself and by reading through the instructions of Charles V, you would realize that the Magellan, Magellan expedition was instructed to exhaust, exhaust as much as possible peaceful and diplomatic means rather than the use of force. Evidently, the cargo itself shows that substantial amount of the Magellan were classified in the manifest as the divas. The divas meaning to say giveaways or gifts. So the, the purpose is that wherever they go, they should give gifts, especially to the chieftains, to the kings, king, <laughs> rather than rather them in warfare and also to the natives that they would encounter, they should be uh, treated well. In fact, one of the instructions said there that you have to avoid the men from uh, interacting with the women of the locality. And Charles Reason Abbey said, most of the causes of violence that had been um, encouraged 
that had been uh, that had been uh, uh, respond that had been given as a response by the natives to Spaniards was actually due to certain issues about issues about issues about the and for that reason uh, they were uh, Charles was giving very very specific details on how he would be treating the natives of these particular territories where they would be encountering them to exhaust uh, peacefulness, diplomatic, other than, other than, other than, pressure, 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 uh, renowned chroniclers, uh, one of the renowned chroniclers of the Magellan, of the, uh, of the, the Spanish Empire, Antonio Herrera. Uh, Antonio Herrera um, was provide, produced a substantial uh, number of volumes of uh, books on the uh, on the history of the Spanish uh, uh, expeditions, and among them. Were among these uh, volumes were focused on the Magellan expedition, and here uh, there's a map in 1600s which gave us an idea, which probably provided um, the Europeans at that time in 1600s how extensive was the territory uh, that Magellan had to traverse in order to reach the Spice Islands and the Philippines, because there were at the time a very very limited notion as to the ex as to the uh, extent of the territory from the America. In fact. Uh, people thought that the America was an endless landmass, and there's no end there, and um, and therefore you you probably won't be able to reach another uh, the the end of that by simply by, by traveling on sea, but probably by simply walking on the on a landmass. But Magellan, based on his studies of the uh, of the um, reports by the uh, uh, by the, uh, the the Solis expedition in South America. And he reckoned uh, that were, uh, the, these reports were actually kept at the uh, Casa de Contratación in Seville. And uh, by studying them, Magellan recognized that the, the American continent was actually tapering off. And therefore, he believed that at the end of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this tapering, of this tapering landmass would be an exit to another oceanic space and that is where Magellan exploited this particular knowledge and looked for a certain passage which we now know as the Strait of Magellan to enable him to enter another territory but as anybody who has read the documents of the Magellan expedition will realize that it takes a lot of courage on the part of Magellan because considering the fact that they were ignorant of the geography from the American continent to the Asian, Asian territory, they do not really know how long would the journey be, and therefore a number of the Magellan crew were already uh, crying out loud in protest of the plan of Magellan to pursue the expedition from the American continent as soon as he found the strait uh, to, uh, to realize his dream of uh, finding the Spice Island. But, uh, as I said, in the wake of this uh, ignorance. Of the, of the space that separates them from America to the uh, Spice Islands, many of the crew of Bajaran refused to join the expedition and to continue the expedition anymore. And, but then Bajaran insisted and therefore uh, realized that and realized the, the dream of finding the Spice Islands and established their foothold in this area. As I said earlier, and although it ended in Tremendous failure because Magellan died, and only 18 of the more than 235 crew returned to Spain and accomplished uh, nothing of what they were actually planning earlier on to secure a foothold in the Spice Island. Yet it provided the subsequent expedition, subsequent uh, uh, expedition, substantial information of not only of Southeast Asia but of the Philippines in general. 
By the way, that's one thing, the one thing that we have to understand that Magellan actually was aware already of the existence of China in this particular, long before the expedition left um, Spain. In fact, in his meeting with Charles, he already brought up the idea that China belonged to the sphere of influence of the Spaniards and does not belong to Portugal. And this, in a way, uh, showed that Magellan was uh, um, encouraging, was stipulating in a way, uh, Charles to support his expedition because of the potential not only of the Spice Islands, but of another important territory, China, to be annexed to the Spanish Empire because of its civilization and tremendous wealth that a number of Europeans had already revealed to the Europeans, such as, uh, such as um, uh, the Italian uh, chroniclers uh, that visited China earlier. So, can we now go to the next, uh, the final uh, set of slides that we have? As we said, the Magellan expedition provided further, deeper information, not only on the Philippines, but on Southeast Asia. And this encouraged Charles Moore to sustain, to continue sending more expeditions to the Philippines and even to Southeast Asia. And we know that the Luaysa the, uh, and uh, the Villalugos expedition and eventually the Legaspi expedition were funded by Charles despite the uncertainty of uh, what they would accomplish out of these uh, expeditions. Yet, it was supported by Charles knowing in a way that there are certain prospects that they uh, that Asia offered them and one of them that eventually cleansed the claim of Spain to Southeast Asia uh, to certain parts of Southeast Asia in particular the Philippines was the Legaspi expedition the, the, the Philippines of course by the time that the Legaspi expedition was launched in 1565, remained to be a major issue of contention between Portugal and Spain. In fact, although the Philippines was actually uh, the Moluccas in a way, was um, uh, in a way sold the rights of Spain, was actually sold to the, to, uh, to Portugal, it's uh, in no way historians to say a theoretical right because there was really no evidence that um, Portugal or Spain even possessed this uh, territory. Yet, 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 uh, uh, Spain was interested in still securing a portion of Southeast Asia, the Philippines, and even possibly um, Spice Islands. One of the most important members of the Legaspi expedition was Fray Andres de Ordaneta. Ordaneta had been with the expedition, earlier expeditions, and stayed in the uh, in the Lucas for about uh, for about ten years. And he was familiar of the culture, of the environment, and of the neighboring territories of the Spice Islands. And he became, in a way, the advisor to. Uh, King Philip this time, and even to the head of the expedition, Legaspi, and some of the uh, royal uh, authorities, uh, they would throw to uh, Ordaneta certain issues in terms of geography and even in terms of jurisdiction. And so when Ordaneta was asked whether it was legitimate for Spain to enter uh, the Philippines, Ordaneta played a very, very, uh, made a very, very careful response to that. He said, okay, the Philippines was actually territorially, uh, in terms legally, so to speak, belongs to Portugal. Yet, it could justify, Spain could justify its passage to the Philippines, saying that the, Philipp that, uh, the expedition would only be um, rescuing those who were left behind 
by the previous expeditions, even in fact of the Magellan expedition, because you have to understand that the Magellan expedition had left the, a number of the crew of the Magellan expedition were left behind in Cebu and were sold as slaves to, uh, to the Chinese. And some of them were eventually captured in the Moluccas. And the series of other ex subsequent expeditions were actually sent in order to retrieve them. And this also became the point of argument of uh, Andres de Ordaneta, who was this time already an Augustinian friar, and Ordaneta advised them that they could pass through the Philippines on the grounds that they were to retrieve only the men of the previous expeditions. But they were not actually aware. Ordaneta, when he joined the expedition, was not aware that they were actually settling in the Philippines. And so, Ordaneta and some of the other uh, Augustinian companions who were sent with the, uh, the Ligaspi expedition were dismayed when they learned that the expedition was actually bound for the Philippines. But then, when they were already in the Philippines, they settled in Cebu. The main historians have not actually questioned why Cebu. The reason is, of course, some of the crew of the Magellan expedition were familiar of the of the uh, of the just expedition were familiar with the uh, with uh, the territory uh, of the Cebu, uh, the geography of Cebu. The Magellan expedition had been there, and the other subsequent expeditions had visited and dropped by Cebu. The other and uh, the Legazpi expedition's major contention was that it was a familiar place, and also. In the mind of Legaspi, and he wrote, uh, he articulated this in some of these uh, re reports to Charles, they were, they have a certain agenda in setting in school, aside from the fact that it was a familiar place for them, because also they have to punish the natives of Cebu. It was intended as a kind of a punitive expedition that the Cebuanos had killed Magellan, and the crew of the Magellan expedition, and therefore, if they did not respond rightly to the Legaspi expedition, then by law of the so-called just war, then they would this they deserve a punishment from the expedition for the fact that they have already committed crimes against the Spaniards by killing Magellan and the. Uh, and the member of the expedition. But the other reason why Cebu was because they knew Cebu was very, very close to the Spice Islands. And in fact, this was among the reasons that Ligaspi had indicated that Cebu uh, provided a very, very useful uh, springboard for the conquest of the Spice Islands. So even as late as 1565, the Spaniards were still entertaining the possibility of securing a foothold outside of the Philippines, and that is the Spice Islands. But then, because of the uh, discovery of the presence of the Spaniards by the Portuguese, so, uh, Governor General Pereira, or General Pereira, uh, eventually confronted um, the Legaspi expedition in 1569 and a war between the Portuguese and uh, the, uh, Spain erupted in Cebu. This compelled the Legaspi expedition to proceed to the northern part, to Panay, but not yet abandoning their plan to resettle in Cebu because apparently of its proximity to the Spice Islands. But because of the series of expeditions sent by the Legaspi expedition to the northern part of the Visayas, Legaspi heard of better settlements outside of the Visayas, and they heard of Manila, and Manila was eventually made the base of the expedition of the Legaspi, of, of the Legaspi expedition. But other than that, other than the post, other than the uh, knowledge of Manila as a, as a uh, 
vibrant city, uh, vibrant uh, settlements, uh, native settlements where trade was going on briskly. It also had another importance for the Legacy Expedition. They learned that Manila would be much, much closer to Japan and China. And for that reason, Manila would be used as a as a strategic jump off point for the Spanish forces and transfer settlements to China and to Japan. Apparently, this idea of Legaspe was supported wholeheartedly by the Augustinians, Martin de Rada and uh, Diego de Herrera and other eminent um, Augustinians who joined, who came with the Legaspe expedition because as Rada and Herrera had expressed in their letters to Spain, to King, and to Mexico, they were very, very much interested to secure control for their mission outposts, China and Japan, because of the sophisticated civilizations that they had as compared to the natives of the islands of the Philippines. And for that reason, they realized that Manila would be a very, very important strategic point to launch their expedition to China and Japan. But while they were based in Manila, they realized they discovered another territory north of Manila, Nueva Segovia. And so, in 1582, the Spaniards in Manila opened Nueva Segovia as a city, as a Spanish city. The reason is because Nueva Segovia was closer to China and Japan than Manila. And in fact, by 1582, a number of missionaries, shortly after the Franciscans arrived in the Philippines in 1578, a number of Franciscans actually left the Philippines via Nueva Segovia without permission from the government of Spain and the Philippines, and even from the newly installed bishop of the Philippines, Domingo de Silasar, because they were interested in proceeding to China and Japan. And so without official permission, it irritated in some way uh, the bishop of the Philippines because he says that it was actually endangering the Portuguese who were already working in China and in Japan at this particular period if they would send another expedition, another group, coming this time from the Philippines, who were Spaniards. Because it appears that there were rumors being spread by the Portuguese in the China and in Japan that the Spaniards were actually pirates. And therefore, the interest, unlike the Portuguese whose main interest was actually trade and more of religion, religious conversion, the Spaniards were there to colonize Japan and China. And I, I think some of us were aware of the fact that by the later part of the 16th century, a certain story of a certain a Spanish captain who was stranded in one of the islands of Japan, who has been boasting uh, of, the mad, of the might of Spain, and, one of, and some of them were actually spies of the, a, certain, um, um, night, um, a certain lords in uh, Japanese lords, and they were trying to trap this guy to reveal certain information which would incriminate Spain. And one of them asked, how come that you became very, very powerful in the world? If, you, if, if, in your, if your statement is true, how come that Spain was became very, very powerful? And he says, well, first we send missionaries, and then later on we send soldiers to colonize a particular territory. That's our strategy. And because of this, some of the spies eventually reported to these lords and reported to the, uh, the emperor and eventually convincing the emperor that Spain had a sinister agenda in Japan and therefore it must close its doors to not only to, uh, the, uh, to the Spaniards but even to other foreign uh, missionaries. And that's precisely the reason why uh, 
uh, the Spaniards in the Philippines were, uh, in a way, although they were very, very interested in uh, securing control of these territories, especially as mission outposts, and eventually, I think, uh, some of the uh, governor generals entertained the possibility of uh, actually sending military expeditions, including uh, one of the early Jesuits in the Philippines, uh, Father Alonso uh, Sanchez, uh, and even the Bishop of uh, the Philippines at the time, Domingo de Salazar, entertain the possibility that aside from conversion, there is also a need that the missionaries should be, accom uh, should be accompanied by military men by, uh, to, be, to establish a military protectorate in order to protect, in a way, the missionaries who would be converting these people to Christianity, because that was, of course, the first mandate of and the book, why the uh, demarcation line and allow, which allowed the Portuguese and the Spaniards to encroach in Southeast Asia was actually uh, given. And this precisely was the reason why eventually the issue in the Philippines became, should, is this, should be the sending of missionaries in Japan and China be simply approached by apostolic means, simply means say by simply mis sending missionaries without any military intervention, or should there be a need for military personnel to accompany the missionaries? But then some of the royal authorities realized that this is actually provoking war. Once they send military escorts to missionaries, it would eventually end in war between China, Japan, and the Philippines. But then, uh, one of the uh, officials, Bishop Domingo de Salazar, at, as, I, as I said later on, entertained the possibility of really engaging in war with the Chinese because he says the Japanese were angry at the Chinese and therefore we can make use of some of the Japanese to accompany the expeditions to China. And as we know, uh, some of the early um, uh, converts to Christianity uh, in Southeast Asia were the Japanese. In fact, some uh, one of the early foreigners um, who were actually um, uh, accepted in the Augustinian order in the Philippines were a number of Japanese. And so uh, they were aware that uh, Japan was more receptive to um, to uh, the Christian missionaries if they would be sent there. But the issue is, should they send uh, soldiers to accompany the expeditions? Um, so I would just end my discussion uh, here too because of the time that we have been Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Rona. Father Renzo, we now have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored to be uh, here with all of you. And also I thank all the organizers for the care for all this work. Uh, I will speak about, I mean, the title is a little maybe misleading in the sense that it's not much about conflict, but I will speak, but anyway. Uh, I apologize from the start that, uh, uh, as I was not sure who will be my audience, so I put very uh, basic things at the beginning, and other things that are more point, uh, pointed things about Japan in the second part. So, uh, if some people feel that, okay, we are not kids, and so sorry for that. So, some key words. Uh, so, when I speak about feudalism, that's not the same as local identity. And I, when I speak about conquista, it's not the same as slavery. And then we see that many of these things get together, but it's not, I'm not speaking in the same the same for colonization and evangelization, as already Dr. Cherona explained a lot about this. And also the adaptation and inculturation, which are for me also different things. 
So for the church, I mean, needless to say, uh, the main and the only, so to speak, reason why the missionaries go is because of the, the, the gospel. I mean, just Jesus said that. So for for us, even with all this inculturation and respect the other religions and so on, we still have this as our faith. So this will not change uh, sugar in the church. But of course, you can always uh, see how, it, how is to proclaim the gospel nowadays and so on. Uh, I will speak a little about the encyclicals of the uh, bishops, uh, the popes uh, at that time. Um, it has been, at least in Japan, always uh, the people, many of the scholars say that the missionaries were mainly conquerors and just helping the uh, conquer or the military enclave uh, and domination. Uh, I like to show the youth that that was not the case, at least from the paper, but of course in the base, in the different places, you will have always, as we have always also, you will have uh, many abuse and so on. So, in already 1435, uh, you have this encyclical secret to do. Uh, this, uh, I will open this, in, and to put it in some English, they say, some Christians, and the Pope said we speak with this with sorrow, that this teacher of reasoning and size and opportunity have approached the said islands by ship, and with armed force, then captive and even carried off to lands overseas, very many persons of both taking advantage of their simplicity. And no less do we order and command all and each of the faithful of each sex within the space of 15 days of the publication of this letter, uh, in the place where they live and so on. This is speaking about the Canary Islands, but that no slavery should be allowed. It's completely clear. And they say that this is the communication for them. Then another book uh, from the Pope, uh, 1493, etc. They say, We therefore are rightly dead and hold it as our duty to grant you and every of your own accord and in your favor for those things whereby with effort each day more hearty that you may invariably for the honor of God himself and the spread of the Christian rule to carry forward your holy and praiseful purpose so pleasing to immortal God. So this is already what Dr. Gerona has said, that the, all the concessions, all the uh, permissions the Pope is giving to the Lord are for this for transmitting the gospel. It's not to colonize or to trade and to profit and so on, even if course they, if they don't have that, they will not go. And then you have the Tratado of Tordesillas, or the spoke. And you see one of the consequences is uh, this planifier of uh, Antino, 1502. You have the line there. But the thing that I want to point you is, this is dividing the rights of, uh, of evangelization. But here, you see Japan and also Philippines and many places of Asia are not considered. So it means the Pope didn't give any rights to the people living in this part of, part of Asia because they didn't know it. They didn't know the existence of uh, Japan and Korea and so on, as you can see here. It's a very graphical thing, and you have Til Malacca and Molucas, of course, and this, that's Timor, and that's it. So. Uh, whatever the rights or the paper said is according to the knowledge that people have at that time. Another uh, encyclical, Sublimus, Sublimus Dei, actually the, the Pope that with the same name, with the same content and date, but the work is a little difficult, you have three different books and encyclicals. And the content is uh, that, of course, uh, the enemy of the human race inspired his satellites not to hesitate to publish a lot that the Indians of the West and the South of other people who have really recent knowledge 
should be treated as stamp roots created for our side pretending that they are in, uh, capable of receiving the Catholic faith. We consider, however, that the Indians are truly men and that they are not only capable of understanding the Catholic faith, but according to our information, they decide exceedingly to receive it. Decided to provide ample remedy and so on, I go to the point. They said Indians and all the other people, so this includes all the Asian people, of course, who may later be discovered by Christians are by no means to be deprived of their liberty or the possession of their property, even though they be outside of the face of uh, Christ, Jesus Christ. So it's very clear, not even if they don't accept the faith, because many people were saying, okay, if they convert, we leave them alone, but if they don't convert, we have the right. And the Pope said clearly here, even if they are not inside of the faith of Christ, they are not to be deprived and enslaved and so on. So it's very clear, already 1537, uh, this document. Of course, the fact that these documents are written and published is that, I mean, shows that in the field these things were not kept. And also, there was no, no point to publish this. Again, uh, Pope uh, Paul III, uh, to the Cardinal of Toledo, he said, we thinking about the Indians, Indians themselves declare that even when they may be outside of the church, should not be deprived of their freedom, their private things, and so on. And we condemn all these evil deeds and ask you to provide that no harm, injury, or, or life takes place. As all of you know, Bartolomé Las Casas uh, denounced slavery very stressed, uh, strongly, and he speaks about numbers here, uh, that uh, they forced them into the ships and gave them very little to eat or drink, and about one or two thirds of the hot Indians died. And the others were brought to Panama and Peru, where the Spaniards were selling them for gold, silver, and pearls. I made an estimation that at least three million of Indians were enslaved by this piracy during my time. Of course, as you know, the numbers of Bartolomé Las Casas are not, uh, not uh, very accurate. But anyway, that there was really a disaster going on, and as far as human rights, it is no, no bad at all. Again, you have this document uh, of uh, uh, Bartolomé Las Casas saying, if we combine the narrative and reflections given as explained in the Holy Scripture and the work of the Holy Fathers of the Church, we conclude that the King of Spain, of Spain is obliged under divine, divine law to declare any Western Indians free from any slavery, not only the one known as servitude or slavery, but also the ones with the name of encomienda or deposit, and the properly so-called. So there was namings there, so very few were called es esclavos. So they were saying encomienda or deposit, whatever, were ways of dis devising, I mean, to di disguising the reality. But here also uh, it's very clear uh, what the bishops of the uh, places, in this case, uh, South America. Again, you have uh, Francisco Victoria, who was uh, in this uh, Spanish text, they say, uh, this brother held the opinion so peculiar and against God and the king, scandalous because of novelty, about the royal race paid in Malacca for the merchandise that passed in the Portuguese ships. He stated that these transactions are with the Chinese slaves that the Portuguese bought, and they do the same with Japanese and others, could be covered fraudulently and without need of restitution. To this, the heaven and the earth claim as the divine law and all the doctors, especially friars of Ingo Soto and Martin. So you can see that there was also some, unfortunately, some religious members, in this case a Jesuit, that was kind of holding the theory that they could actually enslave and they did not restitute what they have done, as the Pope said. But, I mean, this completely, as it's announced here, completely against the church and the teaching and, of course, human rights. Um, 
Intoledo y es por de de Walt Disney things as the Spanish kings were ruling. You have this 1596 uh, ordinance. They say that the viceroys and governors of India should provide for teachers who teach Spanish language to the Indians so that they can learn and be catechists. And they should also name pastors and catechists that know the language of the Indians. And this is one of my points also. When you have a colonization or when you have also a proclamation of the gospel, uh, the question is not just to tell what you have, but to listen what the other people think they are past songs and so on. In that sense, it's very important what Dr. Jorana said about the records. Even if they are not accurate, they show that there was a willing to learn something about the others about the Indians and about the, the Asian people and so on. And this is already uh, said there. It's not that only they have to teach Spanish, they can be catechized, but the pastors, they should know the language of the Indian. Uh, in the English uh, speaking world, you have, for example, some uh, shocking uh, statements. This is already uh, essay that we, I mean, for who thought that is lawful for Christians to use trade and traffic with the infidels or savage, carrying them the either such commodities as they want and bringing from them some of their pens. And things so commonly and generally practiced, both in these our days, this of course 1580s, and in time past beyond the memory of man, both Christian and infidels that it needs no for proof. As it were already decided or clear that slavery was part of this uh, traffic, I mean, commerce, whatever. So you see the mentality of the people at that time that, of course, you have to get into that uh, field of uh, the way of thinking, the way of treating, uh, learning. And of course, the missionaries were some of their times. So, I mean, even if they knew that this was uh, the against the teaching of the church and against what Jesus Christ told us in the gospel, still, all around was more or less that, that the infidels or the local peoples are a kind of bound to be enslaved or treated as lowest. Again, uh, Urbanus VIII uh, uh, put in 1639, again, report saying, okay, they say for it for all and everyone, whether they is secular, secular, ecclesiastic, whatsoever state, sex, degree, condition, and dignity, uh, even should be a person entitled to be specially named, or whatever they belong to uh, any regular order. So you see the Pope here is learning from the uh, excess or the abuse of the uh, people belonging to uh, the religious orders also, because the merchant said, okay, if the father said that it's okay, why could they do it? So it said uh, that to say to buy exchange and give away the for say Indians or to deprive them from their wife or goods and chattel and so on, is not to be uh, accepted and under the pain of a communication already pronounced and so on. So, uh, kind of very regularly, you have uh, 1781, uh, again, more or less the same content uh, of Pope Gregory XVI uh, that saying uh, we reprove them by virtue of our apostolic authority, all the practices above mentioned and absolutely unworthy of the Christian name. By the same authority we be prohibit and strictly forbid any ecclesiastic of life person from presuming to defend as permissible this traffic in blacks under no matter what pretense Text or from publishing or teaching in any manner whatsoever in public or privately opinions contrary to what we have said and so on. So it means that the opposition and the friend was really something that goes against this current to put such a strong statement. Just to give you an example, this is Brazil, but this is a kind of uh, just uh, 
record of uh, kind of merchandise, so to speak, unfortunately. He's speaking about slaves, but you have the numbers there. And of course, you have another with the amount of money, profit, and so on, but I will skip that. Again, uh, use the tense in uh, 1912 already, so we are not so far in time with that. Uh, again, uh, he said, nevertheless, so much has, done been, has been done for the Indians, there is much more that still remains to be done. And indeed, when we consider the crimes and outrage still, still committed against them, our heart is still with horror, and we are moved to great compassion most unhappy things. And again, uh, the more or less the same. Shall dare or presume to reduce the said India to slavery, to sell them, to buy them as well, it is to be, uh, again, uh, uh, to put outside of the church. As well. Now we come to Japan, a more pointal uh, uh, place, the history of uh, exchange or the encounter in Japan with the missionaries, especially with the Jetsu. Uh, as you know, uh, Xavier arrived into uh, Japan in 1549. So about nine years, ten, almost 10 years before he arrives to Japan, uh, you have this appointment of the Pope as a pap papal nuncius. Uh, because there was no bishop here in Japan or this area, so uh, well, you have the other Latin, but they say, the islands of the oceans and the place of India, ahead of the Ganges River, and ahead of the Cape of Good Hope, we name you our, and the apostolic sea nuances for all the islands. So, which is, of course, it's a kind of geographical abuse, so to speak. But anyway, but, uh, what it was not known, or not considered in this uh, uh, land, uh, the division of the Sillas and so on, uh, Francis Xavier received this uh, uh, green light to do or to, to uh, open and so on, missions and so on, because there was no, no bishop, so he was, the, so to speak, the highest authority in the mission of Japan at that time. As you can see in the maps already, uh, Dr. Girona spoke about maps at 1570, uh, you have still Japan there, it's a kind of tiny island the border of the world, and if you open it a little more, you have the up and they are in the center, and what it tells you, you have Insula de Miyako, Miyako is Kyoto at that moment, and it was just a tiny, tiny, uh, tiny island, so it means that what these people, the European people, and of course I'll tell you is a very renowned cartographer, he knows about Japan what is Kyushu. And of course, you have Likyu there, so you have the uh, Kinawa. And of course, the part of uh, Manila and so on, or the Philippines and so on, is quite more uh, detailed, not so accurate, but you have a kind of more detailed. Thing. So that's what they knew about uh, Japan. So one of, or two letters of Francis Xavier from Kagoshima, 1549, when he arrived in Japan, he said, Two Japanese princes are going to India from hence to have been brought up in the University of Beaco. So in Kyoto they were studying, and Bandu is an, another of the uh, universities there in the north of Japan. And he said, take care of to be attentive to them in all things, with every mark of goodwill. The Japanese character is won by love and kindness. That's the intuition of Xavier the same year he arrived. The second, a little later, they say, we shall write you more at length concerning the state of things in Miyako, Kyoto, and the universities, so far as related to the Christian interests. This is this very year, two bonses who have been educated in the University of Miyako, and several other Japanese with them are going to India to learn the mystery of our religion. One of these two, Bernardo, Bernardo of Kagoshima, he is called like that, he went to Rome and uh, knew St. Ignatius, and he entered the novitiate in Coimbra, and he died there. Died. He was not able to come back to Japan. But you see, from the start, Xavier start this cultural exchange, sending these people, uh, not only to be baptized, but after that, so they learn the culture, they see 
with his Europe, with his church, and they come back. These two didn't come back. They were, I mean, they died before. But as you know, they, we have the four boys that went, they met the Pope and came back. Uh, another uh, of the letter of Savior said, a great course of men go from all parts of Japan to the University of Bandu, uh, Ashikawa Gakko, they call it in Japanese, to get and learn. When they return to their country, country in Japan, eh? they are based in Japan, they teach their fellow countrymen what they have acquired. I am told that in Bandu is a very large and well populated town. Now it's a very small town, but that time only it was. Eh, its inhabitants are famous for their noble blood and so on. So again, Xavier was much in favor of getting in touch with these uh, educated people, as Matteo Ricci did in China, so they could exchange ideas. So what I say already is not just to transmit Christianity, to, learn, to make them learn Portuguese or Spanish, it's to learn their language and to learn their uh, culture, their teachings, their uh, religions, so in able to be able to make a dialogue, which is something quite new for that time of uh, for that uh, video of colonization or evangelization in the church. Uh, in some of the records, uh, you have their Korais, uh, so the Korean people, uh, Pasio, uh, Father Pasio, uh, 1594, uh, said they were in this area of Kyushu, a lot of Koreans, not by the Japanese in this war they had it with them. So as you know, Hideyoshi invaded twice Korea and brought many prisoners of war. So there is a record that there were a lot of them there. The first invasion was in 1592. And they say, as they have good knowledge and have capacity for our holy faith, Father Vice Provincial ordained to look for some Koreans who could read and write their language. And the attention is the same as the Chinese, so the Kambu, what they call it here, was a written character, Chinese character, the educated people. And they say these Koreans learned the language and they are well trained in the Catechism. They made a summary of it to their language and they are translating now the prayers in Korean so they could instruct better their countrymen. They did so well this year, but more than 2,000 Koreans got baptized. The Japanese Christians were amazed at their questions, saying that in regard to our faith, the Koreans were by no means superior to them. So, see, in the local uh, sites of Japan, they were considered these people who were, so to speak, uh, prisoners of war, or maybe have been considered as slaves. Many of them were treated as slaves. But still, the, the Christians among them said they saw that there were no difference as far as the Christian uh, capacity. And they asked them, the natives, to learn the catechism and to teach them. Which means, and that's the same for Japan, that mostly of the time, I think 90% of the evangelization in Japan was done not by the missionaries. Xavier didn't speak Japanese. He couldn't speak Japanese. So these 500 people that got baptized during his time, more or less, we know, they were all receiving the Christianity from Lorenzo and from Bernardo, all these Japanese people who converted. And they were the preachers. They were the only, uh, except some few exceptions I will present after that. Most of the times, the missionaries were just helping or telling the locals what they have to do, and they were helping them with translation, but they were not able to speak. So, the so-called evangelization in Japan was done by Japanese, by not by the uh, foreign missionaries. In most of the time, I'm mean, not uh, making a general statement, but that's something that many, many people and many scholars are not aware of. For example, uh, according to this slave problem, uh, you have Bishop uh, Martin, uh, Peter Martins, and also uh, Bishop Sarqueira, the two who were able to work in Japan because the other two uh, were not able to come to Japan, they died before that. But, uh, for example, he said uh, here, Bishop Sarkeria said that the father had a true knowledge and so on. 
And this case of servitude system, so you see they were kind of using a kind of nice wording to avoid the fact that there was slavery there. In this case of the servitude system of Japanese Korea was very difficult and delicate. For this information we have in this particular subject, he saw that this system was a word that evil by intelligent person and believers, not only in China and India, but also in Europe. Therefore, he felt that in order to accomplish his duty, it was necessary for him to renew the communication with the same penalties they have already told the fathers uh, he drew after here. So you see again, there was this, uh, after the invasion of Korea, there were many people who were brought back. So Bishop said, okay, to the ones who are Christians, many of these, Konishi Okinawa, for example, who was you know, the big uh, Japanese warriors, he was a Christian, they say, okay, if you don't free these people, uh, you have to, uh, you, you will be excommunicated. Of course, for these people, it was completely normal. You invade, you win, you bring people, they, they are slaves to you for life. That was more or less a rule inside of Japan also. But again, this communication with the Catholic Church, with the bishop, and the, this receiving of Christianity, is a kind of change in the society of that time in a very small scale. Of course. I'm not saying that this completely changed the situation of Japan at that time, but there was some kind of new thing, so a positive exchange, learning from Japanese ways of doing, and the Japanese, especially the ones who became Christian, were learning about a Christian way of doing things. A father Spinola, after that time martyr, he was being beatified in 1602, said, at the following year, there were some ambassadors who came from Korea to negotiate the repatriation of many Koreans who were brought from to Japan. This is after the invasion. Some were Christians, so to form the Christianity there in Korea and to avoid that, uh, that the ones returning were lost, asked the consultant and received permission to go. But because there were so many impediments, this could not be put into effect. So it was already a kind of project of repatriation and of kind of founding a different way of a Catholic Church there in Korea. This didn't happen at that time. As you know, Korean uh, Catholic Church started quite later in a different way. But anyway, there was that project of them. Uh, we are uh, seeing now a confidential letter of Father Ocantino to Father uh, General uh, 1589. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because it's one of the few letters we have of uh, relation with uh, Christians and the lords of that time, the rulers of that time. So I want to use a little time to do this. This is Orlantino writing. Finally, Father Ruiz Roy started giving thanks for all the favors received till then. He added that His Majesty, Hideyoshi, decided to conquer Shimo, it means Kyushu, and even more to pass to China to conquer it, his majesty should contact Father Gaspar Cuello, present here, and he could help a lot of this. Of course, Cuello could not speak Japanese, that's why he is uh, in the interpreter. Because he has almost all Shimo under his command. You can imagine this way of speaking at that time, it was not, not very, <laughs> that's not a happy way of uh, introducing himself, but anyway. And if he needed one or two ships, all this could be given by the Southern Father, and he could give him the Portuguese, uh, with the Portuguese. To me, Orantino, and all the people around, this seemed a very inappropriate and pernicious talk, not only for our society of Jesus uh, the Jesuit, but also to the whole Christianity. So I tried to interrupt suddenly the talk of Father Freud, and the same did Takayama Ukon, insisted but it was not possible to stop the mention part. So you see here Takayama Paul against with uh, uh, Freud or the superior Gaspar Cuello, he saw that it was not a not good way of <laughs> managing things. Juan Baku Hideyoshi spoke then that saying that he didn't expect to live more than 60 years and given that there is no more in this life than to live and to die, so there was no afterlife for him. He was in a hurry to win a name and fame in this life. 
and that this will be the only thing left to a man after his death. For that reason, he believed that our fathers were coming to Japan. With so many trials and from so far away, just came to win fame and name as he was doing. And there was no war after him. The secretary sent us, I, I got some of this. The secretary, who was happened to be Christian, sent out some people grieving and warning that this kind of talk in front of Kambaku, Hideyoshi, was disgusting and it was a presumptuous and pernicious thing. Uh, this kind of uh, translation or negotiation, secret negotiation, because you see it's a confidential letter, uh, was something that happened there. So uh, when Hideyoshi blamed the fathers uh, to be in favor of uh, colonization or whatever, he has some reason, not that everyone, you can see here, was not that all the fathers, all the Christians were in favor. There was Takayamoko and Yuka Bordantino against, but still, there were different opinions, and some of them were not happy at all. So, to speak like this. Then you have, uh, from the invaded parts uh, of the, the Korea, uh, you have this document, it's a, it's a diary. I said uh, in the first month of the second year of Keicho, which goes to that uh, date I put up here in 1597, among the many merchants that came from Japan, there were those who traded people. Walking back after the troops, buying men and women, old and young, tying them with ropes by their hands, gathering them and making them walk before them. And if they did not walk, the sight of their striking them uh, to make them run and so you see, uh, this was kind of normal, uh, normal, not to say common uh, idea that uh, in all this place, this slavery and this uh, kind of war, war uh, state giving or not rights and so on was much common. And it was, of course, not approved, even in this case, for the Buddhist monk. He says uh, that it's really it's painful to see this thing happen. Then you have uh, Valiano, for example, uh, after he, he learned from experience, uh, he said, in places where new conversions start, let us proceed with maturity and prudence. Even if the local lord and many of his vassals become Christians, avoid making noise, destroying his temples, and recognize things like this. Goes. Even when the convert decide to do so, to destroy the temples and so on, they shouldn't be allowed. The idols, or the Buddhist uh, images and so on, should be gathered and burned in secrecy and little by little. The temple should be transformed into churches or given another convenient use so that they remain, preventing the Gentiles saying that whatever we enter, we destroy and desolate everything. So you see, Vajrayana was not in favor of destroying the Buddhist the images and so on, but he cares for the kind of scandal they did. So in that sense, it's a kind of in-between a dialogue or an inculturation. He's not still seeing the Buddhist teaching as a Vatican II say as part of the life. No. But still, it shows that there was a different approach. And you cannot go and compare and destroy everything that was there before. But that's not the way of preaching the gospel. So it was a kind of because of all these things that the missionary got caught with this slave trade and because they were coming in the ships that were for trade, so they were considered to be part of the trade for the Portuguese and so many things got together. But again, Valignano said, okay, we have to clarify there what is and what is not proper of a missionary or a, a church a Christian. Uh, going to the prohibition, that uh, Hideyoshi uh, started in, uh, in Japan and then stayed uh, all the way till the Meiji period, so about 250 years of prohibition, even more if you consider this as a start. But what I wanted to, to show here, I mean, to emphasize is the purpose of the black ships is trade, and that is a different matter. As here and most past, past trade may be carried on in all sorts of articles. 
From now on, all those who know this term Buddhism may freely travel from the Christian country and return. So that was the point of Valignano. If you don't touch Buddhist, Buddhism in Japan, you are allowed for this degree to stay in the state. But of course, the point was that, uh, normally speaking, this conversion of people to Christianity, uh, of course, they were formerly Buddhist or Shintoist. So this was influencing hardly the local uh, religions and so on. Again, there you have a clash that you have to resolve that, but well, even nowadays we have to resolve, but uh, you see that there was kind of mixing things together. As we have seen, Hideyoshi said, okay, I don't believe in the afterlife, I don't believe in that. The only thing that cares to me is this fame and so on. So it's very coherent in that sense. We are seeing now uh, Avila Chiron is, uh, he was a merchant, a perfect Christian, but not a missionary, uh, close to the 16th, uh, I mean, already close to the expulsion of all Christianity, uh, including Takayama Okon and so on, uh, in Japan. He said, uh, I still remember that in 1597, when Toyo Yoshi made war in Korea, they brought many Koreans, mostly women. At that time, I had five Korean girls, my slaves, Mrs. Clavas, he said in Spanish. Three of them were proficient in Japanese. I called them and they looked at each other with a little smile. They called the, the smallest of them called Maria, so she was a Christian, and started to explain the meaning of this painting. The paintings uh, were uh, the Korean paintings of uh, Christianity and so on. So he wanted to know if there was something. So say so, yeah, Hiron said that I have five uh, slaves and he seems to be uh, much, uh, I mean, he treats them well, it seems, uh, and he, his reputation for them is very good, but he considered it very normal uh, to have slaves and to uh, ask them to do things and so on. So, uh, Mateo de Coros, by a commission of uh, Sarqueira, we have already said, they say, uh, more or less, the different reason, uh, reasons uh, and so on that could be given in favor or against. Uh, so already Dr. Girona spoke about the, res the reasons of claiming property or uh, rights to be there and so on. It was uh, about the, uh, this trade and so on. Because of course, uh, you have slaves, it was to have uh, work uh, people who work for you, a uh, chip and so on, so many things that are together, unfortunately, with this uh, trade and so on. Accordingly, in the middle of, accordingly, many Japanese who live around Nagasaki, the port to which, which the China ships comes, say in the eagerness of the Portuguese to seek them out and to buy them, you know, not only went themselves to different parts of Japan to buy Koreans and bring them, send them to the Portuguese, but even went to Korea to steal people gathering them by force and uh, well, as well as from places uh, now subject to them. And in this race, they may have been clearly killed by the Japanese and all that come to the side now, kindly in them to sell them to the Portuguese to go to the, to the ship to China, coming now to the uh, Japanese themselves. So among them also there was this division of, uh, but again, what I want to show there is uh, there was awareness, because also here in Japan we have the problem sometimes that many uh, scholars and many the common people say, okay, but the missionary actually didn't know what, what was going on, so they were made part of this trade or this colonization, invasion, without knowing, no, no, actually they knew what was going on. They were not able to stop and so on, to stop them as well. Now, to change a little the subject, uh, I want to go to this more in, uh, cultural exchange, so to speak. From the beginning, uh, from the start with uh, Francis Xavier and so on, they realized that the Asian people are much more of written language, more than spoken one. So they started to uh, print. Uh, this is a good, good book painted 
uh, made in Japan. You have the IHS, they are made in Europe in that you have. Uh, a pater noster, so the old father, you have Ave Maria and Credo. So the three main prayers of the uh, Christian church translated into Japanese and distributed about the people. Of course, not all the people could write uh, and read, but uh, most of them they will hear what someone who can read. Could read. So it's already in Japanese uh, of that time. Uh, so not only translated, but also able to be used uh, just one page and you distribute it. Uh, so to give an example of this Dochirina Christian, the Japanese Catechism of uh, uh, 16, uh, or, or they said uh, the, some of the content, pupil. What do we direct the Hail Mary prayer? The Master said to our most venerated lady, Virgin Saint Mary. What do we ask? The forgiveness of our sins. Master, no, we don't ask that to our lady. Pupil, shall we ask for the grace of glory? No, we shouldn't ask her those things either. Whom should we ask this thing gift? We ask those to our Lord God. Then, what shall we ask from Our Lady? We ask Our Lady to intercede for us, so our God will grant us those gifts. You see, the very simple way they are showing, that because in Japan you have this Yorozo uh, no Kamigami, they call it, so the thousand, thousand gods. So you have so many gods there, no one is there, of course, are completely absolute. So they were afraid that they could they will kind of mix as if Our Lady was another God together with Christ. So to make it clear, I say, well, we don't ask that to Our Lady. We ask Our Lady to intercede for us. It's a very simple, I mean, I translate it uh, like this, but it's a very simple Japanese also at that time. Uh, to show that Our Lady is not God, that she intercedes for us. Again, you have a printing of different texts of the Mass. For example, this second Sunday of Advent, the readings are the same. We are using now. I was surprised to see that 400, well, almost, yes, 450 years ago, they were using the same readings of the Church, uh, the same Gospel. So you see there, say, Matthew chapter 11. And then it's written in Japanese, but in Roman characters, so the people could read it, I mean, the Mishka is could be. Just to give an idea how much printing work was done in Japan at that time, you have uh, this list of uh, you have spiritual exercises, you have uh, grammar, you have a piece of tables, you have Heike Monogatari, which is a classical Japanese uh, world, uh, book, and of course you have Manual for Compassion, Guia do Pecador, all this, I mean, this kind of huge amount of work. Uh, most of you are fam familiar with the work done by Richie, Aleni, and so on in China, but already in Japan it was the same. Actually, Valiano he was one of the promoters of this local language learning. He was not able to do that, but he encouraged the people to do that. Again, just a kind of graphic thing, you have uh, this Yobu, uh, where you have the missionary teaching and you have the tea ceremony, I mean, the people bringing tea and so on. So it was a quite Japanese church at that time. Again, you see, uh, this is supposed to be Valiano because in the record says that he was very high, very tall. And this is supposed to be Brother Lorenzo, uh, the one, one of the first Japanese to receive baptism, and the one who was healthy. Uh, Savior and the other missionaries. As you know, Lorenzo is the one who baptized Takayama Oponki when, when he was a child. Uh, and about this Lorenzo preaching, uh, Lorenzo was almost blind, so it's amazing that he had learned so much Christianity. But you see, Luis Almeida, who was one of the few missionaries that was able to speak Japanese, because he went there as a kid, he was 11, 12 when he reached Japan, and then under, after that, into the he said, he said, what struck me was not the content of Lorenzo's sermon, which is the same as our for, but the way he convinced them that it was really so, and his interesting and clear way of speech. 
To make it easier to understand, he performed the part of the failure, contradicting what he had just said. Then, taking up his criticism, he refuted so amazingly that the people were surprised. After his talk, that must have been three hours, everyone accepted that God was the only to be a Jew. So as you can see, this brother, because he was almost blind, he was a youth player. So what can, you can understand that probably he changed the, the melody and the, the tone of voice to represent this pagan kind of hunter or putting the uh, doves that usually the people will have and then refuted it back. So it was a kind of different way of sermon that no missionary at that time would be able to, that's why Almeida is so amazed that he writes this in the, in the letter, you have the original back in there. So uh, it was a different way of preaching, a more amazing or more entertaining way, but again, as already said, the preaching was done by the Japanese, not by the missionaries, most of the time. Here you have some uh, people preparing for confession, people confessing and so on. Amazingly, the people who wrote these views, paintings, they were not Christians, so they paint what they saw without knowing what's going on. Again, uh, this is manual for confession. Uh, this is a replica done in 1869, uh, but the original was painted in 1603 in Japanese ladies. So it's more or less the preparation for confession that you will have nowadays, the content is not much different. But again, already uh, written in Japanese and explained in Japanese. This is a translation from the Japanese. They say, the most important thing for a person is to save his or her life, uh, his soul. So following the golden words of our Lord Jesus Christ, what good is to grab the world of one if you lose your soul? And there is no treasure in the world that can buy your soul. So in order to save your soul, there is no better way than the one of contrition. Contrition is genuine repentance. I mean, this is kind of my translation from the classical Japanese you know, in the original, but the content is that. So they are giving the word of our Lord and they are showing why contrition is important. Again, you have this translation of Figia the Pecador, which, as you know, is uh, the with Granada, uh, so they were uh, translating not only uh, Jesuit works but also Dominicans and other friars. Uh, they kind of well, the best sellers in Europe at that moment were also translated into uh, Japan and uh, published in Japan. And then you have small vocabulary there, uh, so the people will understand what are the words and how you use them in text and. So this is very interesting because nowadays it's important to see how they were using the words. Uh, Japanese classic is not the same as nowadays, uh, so it's good to know and to know many uh, use of many words. Uh, this is uh, kind of really the textbook of the students, the seminarians of uh, the Japanese seminarians at that time. Pedro Gomez, who was a scholar, I mean a theologian. Uh, was teaching in Japan with the aid of translation from Father Freud, because Father Gomez was not able to, to he was not, uh, he didn't know Japanese. So, as you can see, there were already textbooks written in uh, Japanese at that time. Actually, this uh, copy was found in Oxford not so long ago, about maybe 15 years ago, and you have this. Uh, Already, uh, Aristotle is, I mean, well, I mean, the philosophy and theology we study nowadays more or less, but written already in Japanese. As the uh, cultural exchange goes, one of the highlights were this embassy of the Cold Boys uh, was already uh, spoken in the first uh, speakers already. Father Giron, uh, Dr. Girona spoke about that. So, these four boys went to Europe. Uh, so the Pope uh, met the Pope and came back. So it was a kind of uh, performance, so to speak, to show that these Japanese people were not uh, barbarous people or cultural people and so on. So kind of performance to show uh, the people, especially the Pope, that these were people like ours, like us, 
and they were not able to not only able to learn Christianity, but they were fluent in English, no, in Latin, and in Portuguese, and so on. As you see here, you have a letter of Ito Mancho, Ito Don Mancho, one of these four boys is there. Uh, he wrote a letter to the Pope thanking him two years after he to the Pope, thanking him, and his, his Spanish is really very nice. Of course, he has had to retreat him and been helped by the missionaries or whatever, but still, the Japanese has to write to the Pope in Spanish, answering the letter, uh, without much uh, travel, so to speak, and to be able to communicate. Uh, coming a little more local thing, so to speak, for most of you, uh, you have this uh, Ruson Tsubo, uh, Ruson, uh, de Rodriguez uh, Collins, because it's, some of them are small ones. And they say, all this, this is from uh, Rodriguez, uh, who was also very proficient in Japanese and Japanese culture. They say, all these items are steam and have a high value. Among the small caddies, the kettles and the large caddies of cha, there are always steam and fetch a very high price. Among this, this large caddies called Busan Subo uses to preserve the cha leaf, have a very high value because of the following reason. In addition to being rare and limited in number, because they were imported, they possess a special property of preserving the cha leaf from one year to another with such a constancy that it always seems to be as fresh even at the end of the year, as, they, as when it was poured in. They also improve it by the flavor, sweetness, mildness, and so on. So the Japanese were much in favor of this, and they found an important thing that it was so much in according to their tradition of the uh, tea ceremony. In addition, these large studies of, are of such exterior workmanship, shape, place, and proportion that they compare well with all our items, the other instances of channel view. This is the general, almost principal condition so for the channel view. And Rodríguez go on forever speaking about the tea ceremony, but just to show you one of actual <laughs> Uh, relation. Uh, so you have this Luzon uh, Tsubo, uh, it was uh, exchanged not so long ago. And again, you can see what Rodi uh, was saying about the old ones. And probably this is also a very old one. Maybe some of the uh, famous key masters, as Takayamoko, they have used it for the TV. So this is an, an exchange, a cultural one, and a very positive one. I was done through this missionary work and so on. So this is also in culturalization, or maybe this is in culturalization in the uh, actual way we use it. It's not just dramatic Christianity, but learning and accepting and highly valuing the culture and the knowledge of the other people. Not seeing that they must be inferior as people who should, you have the right to, to slave or you have teach uh, your, what you have and no give them the, the opportunity to refuse and so on. No, no, this is already exchanged in the best way of uh, things. And I think this uh, this exchange of this Busan Tsubo done not so long ago also is very symbolic. I really was very touched when I received this picture from Robin Gogo, uh, telling me that it's still going up. Another kind of exchange, this is more uh, spiritual one, a foreign way of painting, Our Lady and so on, done in Japanese rice paper. Uh, quite, quite deteriorated, but still going on after many years, after almost 450 years. And then you have the translation of the spiritual exercise, exercise of St. Ignatius. This was also kept in the Philippines, uh, as you can see here, Manila. So this was conserved in the Philippines. If they were in Japan, there were many examples in Japan. I also this and none of them remain in the country. So because it was sent out, it remained uh, as a witness of this work. And this is a content. So this is from Japanese, uh, classical Japanese and Roman letters. 
And if you trespass it to conscience, it will be like this. This is a third one, a work in scholarship. Just to give an idea how they adapted it, not just translated, they say, as we can see, contemplation is like a mirror. If the mirror is clean, when we face it, we can see things that usually are not visible to our eyes. When we contemplate, we are able to see spiritual things really, spiritual realities, and we are able to reform our lives. A second quote, the short prayers we offer to God are a way of to offer ourselves to Him. They are like the piece of wood we feed to the fire. With them, we keep it. We keep the fire of our devotion from getting cold and improve our state of life. Actually, in the spiritual exercise of Sri Nisho, there is no, no passage like this too. So these are completely made. So they <laughs> will be kind of uh, uh, not allowed nowadays. If you are translated the book and you put whatever you like. But again, you can see the content that is a person who really has done the spiritual exercise and who know what is contemplation, who knows what is emotion, and it's written this in Japanese. So it means that some Japanese people who received the spiritual exercises of singing issues were able to translate not only the words, but also the way, the, the examples, and so on. This is really already an inculturation of uh, this spiritual heritage that is for us, for Jesus, very important. Uh, when the persecution was very high at the time when Lorenzo Ruiz was killed there in uh, Nagasaki, uh, there were some pamphlets, they were a preparation of, for martyrdom. And some of the passages said, There are Christians who might wonder why God doesn't punish and destroy the evil deal to it. If there is a real God, why would He not act? Look, the Creator of heaven and earth would not know what to do. Rather, it is just our weak knowledge that prevent us from understand why he had like this. So again, you can see this could be said used for us during the pandemic and many other places. So this is eternal, <laughs> eternal religion, but uh, very nicely. Uh, you have some uh, Christians uh, from different confrarias, misericordia and so on, who ask, permission to the, in this case, to the general of the Jesuit. I'm going to speak a little because um, the time is already closed. And you have, of course, in China, uh, you have the translation of many things from China, the tradition and so on. And this was also used in uh, Japan. Uh, during that time, then you have the prohibition going stronger and so on, and you have this notice of prohibition and the reward. The reward offer is, you see, for the denouncer of the priest, 500 silver coins, which is a huge amount of money. The brother and a returnee is the one who denounced the face and came back. Come back, of course, decide to decide to the market. And the catechist and so on. How, this is how the officials at that time uh, kind of rank the, uh, the people, the Christians, because they were more influenced and so on. But ironically, you know, these persecutors, they have to know, or they became to know how the church uh, hierarchy and how the church work. So, amazingly enough, we, I mean, the, the persecutors also, we are being educated <coughs> by, sorry, by uh, this way of behaving of the Christians. We have the trampling ceremony that they have to step on the holy image to show that they were not Christians. And you have, of course, huge persecution of burning people out in the uh, sulfur waters and so on. Uh, for example, we have another part of inculturation will be this uh, 15 mystery of the Rosary. It's a Japanese painting. But again, you have there uh, Saint Ignatius, you have Francis Xavier, uh, all together with Our Lady and the Rosary. The hidden Christians, the Kakure Christians, of course, they have this kind of painting. Uh, that is, as you can see, mostly a copy of this. Uh, and this things we are supposed to be Shintoist, but again, the Christians, the Christian Christians were using it as a disguise. Again, you have the Chasubo there, this is not a Rousseau, but 
but it is uh, for the team, and they put many of these things inside. Because they were clear enough to know that the officials will not destroy every uh, recipient of chat because then we will have tea for the next season. So among these hundreds, thousands of subo they have, they put in one of those, probably was already numbered, the tenth one probably has this hidden place for Christian objects. Then again, you have this panel that they call Maria Quanon. So because it's close to the image of Our Lady, they were using this to, re to pray to Our Lady during the time when no Christian artifact was around. Again, you have a Maitreya that was brought from Korea, probably in the invasion of Hideyoshi. It, is, it was done quite before that, but I mean, probably it was brought to Japan. And you see, interesting, because the lady that had this uh, statue, <coughs> she was a hidden Christian, she said, I was told he is something because he fasted 46 days for us. So it means that this person knew about uh, the fasting of our Lord, and he was kind of rewriting this story. This is just a Buddhist subject. It was never meant to be a Christ relation. But the people were using it as to represent Christ. And this for me is very important because it shows that they knew that the real religion, real Christianity, is in your heart, not in the object you have in front of you. If your heart is directed towards that, you can use even a Buddhist image to pray, and this not only will go, but I mean, they kept this seventh generation, they kept their faith through this kind of practice. So this is already showing is not only inculturation, but it's a kind of in the culture you have to be able and to be creative enough as to express what you have, what you want. Okay, this is uh, already uh, the time, so I go to the conclusion. I'm going to clear. Again. Yeah, that's so okay, sorry. Uh, so, okay, if uh, I can go a little more, uh, let me see. Uh, well, this will be uh, Anthony Thomas uh, was a Jesuit that lived during that period, and he sent to uh, Father General a proposal to go back to uh, Japan. But of course, it was completely impossible. So he thought about an expedition from the Mariana Island. So this proposal, it was uh, to make a school of Japanese and Chinese there, and then send the people who could speak almost like natives. So here, for example, is an application, and you have Japanese etsinam alumni. So the teachers of Japan and China, with their the Mariana Islands and so on, uh, start to learn, and then can, the idea was to smuggle them into Japan. It didn't actually work, as far as we know, for example, uh, at least. But still, uh, we have this uh, record uh, already in 1831 uh, of some Japanese that went to the coast of uh, Manila, I mean, to, to uh, the Philippines. And they were uh, treated with charity as a Christian to people in trouble. The stranded people have some medals attached, and they show supernatural religious reverence toward them. The people ask what this object were, and they have what they have written, but the answer were uncertain. But it was clear that they had received them from their ancestors, and they were esteemed, and they esteemed them much. They didn't know anything about Christianity, but they received instruction, and except three, all of them received baptism. We could collect that even now the European teaching is known in, in Japanese, but they feel frustrated because it was prohibited. They were willing to receive missionaries in Japan, but the emperor and the officials were again. So this is a beautiful witness of uh, before the re-entry of the French missionaries back in Japan. Already there were some, uh, I mean already, the, some people just happened to be stranded there the shipwreck, and they knew that these hidden Christians, they didn't call themselves Christianity, Christians, but they were using these medals and things like that. And then you have this re, the re-encounter of the, the, the 
Christian missionaries came back, the French missionaries. And this is the reencounter in 1865. They say, as the French priest lowers his gaze from the cross, he was started to see a group of dozen Japanese men, women, and children approach the church and, tr and try the Lord. Home. The inquisitiveness seemed to surprise what they may use for use on others. So, uh, who daily pass? Father Petitian decided to go over and let them in. How did the Hagi get out to pray when the three of us stepped forward and knelt at his feet? In a lower voice, they say, All of us share you in the same, the same heart. They started this responded, Indeed, but where are you from? We are from Murakami. We are nearly all of us, or all, all believe as we. So it means Christianity. The first woman they are said, Santa Maria no Kosovo, where is the a statue of Our Lady. When the woman requests to see the image of the Virgin Lady, Father uh, Petitian says he was without doubt in the presence of the descendants of the ancient Christians in Japan. So, again, they have kept their faith in spite of not having missionaries and so on. They were able to find a way to, uh, to keep this. Uh, so, which is also very important for us. I mean, nowadays with so much uh, consumerism and pandemic, we say, okay, how can we share the preach? We don't have people coming, we are locked down and so on. There is this, there should be a way. We are, unfortunately, we are not clever enough that to find it, but I mean, it's really uh, what our ancestors have shown is that it was difficult for them also, and they were able to keep their face and to show it and to transpass it to the different generations. Uh, some conclusions. Uh, first, we all said today with the two speakers, uh, you can have clear the idea the need to consider historical records from the writer's point of view. Uh, no record is objective or neutral. neutral. The same applies to the Jesuit records I use, and the same applies to the talk I'm giving now. I don't pretend to have the truth with myself. Some of you may and dissent from what I say, and that's completely right. I just give my interpretation, which is, which I, I think it is a fair one, but again, I know that is completely chasing biased, and sorry for that, but I mean, that's my, <laughs> my life, my way of living, so I have no other way of living. So they need to choose records, because not every record is, has the same, the same power, the same value. Uh, so, with some of the conclusion is, uh, we have seen already that often means not all evangelization is colonization, and of course the opposite can be said. Again, that slavery was always prohibited by the church. And this in the papers, the popes and so on, we have seen this all the time. No pope say, okay, you have rights, or if the people are uh, from, they don't have culture, they can be colonized, or no. This never really actually never happened, but it was interpreted that way. And really, we have to to be aware of that and to, to of course to, uh, show uh, repentance and so on. Again, feudalism and unification have positive and negative effects on local and international relations. And we can see there this isolation of Japan, this persecution, also brought many things. Uh, important from the Christian, there are many things we can learn about this also. Again, that only part of adaptation becomes inculturation. Uh, you adapt to be known for the other people to know and so on, but inculturation is really be part of the culture and your religion, your way of doing, speaking, and so on, they should be part of that. And again, the dialogue of people and culture is needed, but it's also difficult. We have seen this to be history of the two the, the, the talks today, that it was always struggle, and they will be always. But uh, this is needed. You cannot just ignore the other because he has a different religion, because he has a different culture, or whatever, or because he's a child, or whatever. So this is uh, some, these are some of the conclusions we can have from the talks today. So thank you for your attention, and I hope the rest of this symposium will also be helpful for all of us. Thank you very much.
for both presentations of Dr. Rona and Father Renzo, while interwoven and uh, uh, connected in some in many ways, poured into voluminous archives. Let's just imagine how these two historians, Father uh, Renzo and Dr. Deron, how they had poured so much into those archives. Not just research, but also to interpret for us the meanings of those historical archives. They have clarified so many of our misconceptions that we have been uh, brought to learn when you were in school, or growing up. Uh, yes, they are uh, things to ponder on, but they have given us a peek into what the lives were of those courageous people. There's so much to reflect. These presentations has given us reflections of our soul, our society. I hope uh, these presentations have encouraged us to revisit, to rediscover our history, so that we ourselves can re rediscover ourselves in our society. But on a lighter note, don't you um, read the tags of our presenters, our guests, our keynote speakers? Dr. Danilo Madrid Perona, as Madrid as his middle name, and Father uh, Renzo, who I heard from him was just uh, short of Lorenzo, and there were so many Lorenzos in his uh, presentation. Um, it's quite an amusing um, thing to ponder on. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Girona, Father uh, Renzo. Now we come to the open forum part of our symposium. For this segment, we have with us a lecturer from the Ateneo de Manila University's Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Rosel Tricia Reyes. Thank you, uh, Ms. Raquel. Uh, I agree with uh, what Ms. Raquel said earlier about the extensive research that you did, most of the speakers did, and I think it's also out of their passion about these topics. All right, at this point, we would like to call Dr. Han Danilo Herona and Father Renzo De Luca to join the open forum. Throughout the talks, we, all, we actually received a lot of questions from our uh, participants. Uh, but in, in, in the interest of time, we can only uh, accommodate a few questions. But I hope, uh, Father De Luca and Dr. Herona, we can send you the questions so that you can answer them later. And then we'll share them with the participants later on. All right. For uh, Dr. Herona, I actually read the parts of... Sorry, but only parts of your book. <laughs> I wasn't able to actually finish it. But even that short uh, reading that I did, I was actually very, uh, I learned a lot about Magellan. So uh, as an expert of uh, Ferdinand Magellan, with the many years of research that you did, how would you like us and the future generations remember him? Um, thank you very much, Rice, for the, the question. Well, one thing is Ms. Magellan has been misunderstood for a long time. I think so much misunderstanding has been hit on him, as even especially among the Filipinos. That always, uh, uh, if you look at the social media during the 500 years celebration, they have been condemned Magellan as the harbinger of colonization, of all these evils and that Spaniards brought upon us. As I said earlier, first we have to understand the fact that he, the expedition was not directed to the Philippines. It was intended for the Spice Islands. But secondly, although it was not actually um, intending originally as a missionary uh, expedition, Magellan took upon himself when they landed in Cebu to convert the natives. There were no missionaries in the expedition, contrary to popular belief. There were only secular priests. But it was out of Magellan's volition to, out of his piety, if you look at the, the, uh, the last will and testament of Magellan, you will be overwhelmed by his sense of piety. Much of what he, uh, he wrote there was to donate all the money that he would get if ever he survived or he died to the churches and the chapels in Spain. And that already reflected to us the kind of piety that Magellan espoused when he came to the Philippines and, as I said, out of his own volition. 
he uh, initiated the evangelization of the Philippines. Other than that, the method that he adopted, there were very, very little issues about uh, violence, of course, except for the Battle of Mactan. But Magyana exhausted, even in the Battle of Mactan, this is a very, very misunderstood issue in Philippine history, Magyana exhausted more diplomatic means to bring about a more peaceful settlement of the differences between Humabon and Lapu-Lapu. So I think we have to study more about him. We have barely understood him. And I think as more records from the archives in Spain uh, would uh, be accessible to Philippine historians, then we will be able to appreciate more of uh, Spanish intrusion in the Philippines. Rather than a more condemnatory attitude, we will be having more conciliatory and probably a more deeper appreciation of our being a Filipino as a result of this process of uh, more of uh, interaction between the Spaniards and the Philippines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Heron. I agree. Uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings about uh, Magellan and what happened during that period. But I, this this talk, like uh, like what we ha we're having right now, is very important, especially uh, with the youth, to really understand uh, what happened in our history. Thank you so much, Dr. Heron. Father De Luca, there are a lot of conversations happening in the chat box right now. Uh, our uh, fellow uh, Jesuit priests, your fellow Jesuit priests and missionaries are actually conversing about the interesting topic that you uh, shared with us. Uh, we're very fortunate that you were able to share all those doctrines, all, the, all those things that uh, you presented uh, earlier. So uh, actually, there are a lot of um, inquiries about sharing your uh, <laughs> presentation. Would you be open to that? <laughs> If ever, um, we will uh, just inform our uh, audience uh, later on if um, we'll be able to share uh, uh, Father De Luca's presentation. Um, all right. For Father De Luca, I understand that you spent a good number of years on research about Nagasaki. You studied and even lived there. And uh, despite the place being a small Christian community with a po small population as well, uh, what was very noble? or special about this place for you? Well, uh, the Christianity, I mean, is still there, even if Christianity is not the majority in Nagasaki nowadays, but it's still quite higher than in the rest of the country. So you can uh, feel that the people are interested, for example, now, as you know, two, three years ago, the world heritage uh, of the Christian churches was declared, which is something really new in Japan. Till now, we always always uh, think not related with Christianity. Christianity was still, or maybe some people still think of it as something foreign. But uh, again, as we, can, we have seen today, uh, is part of this culture in, in Japan. And Nagasaki, in that sense, because they have received many more missionaries because they have quite more, I mean, they have thousands of martyrs, like Lorenzo Ruiz and many others. So the people are quite more uh, used to that culture. So it's a more kind of uh, receiving, more uh, kind of accepting uh, culture, I think, than the rest of the country. So for me, it's always, and many, many Christians, they wish that at least once they have been there in, in Nagasaki and so on. So, uh, once Corona is a little <laughs> better, <laughs> I encourage all the people, the participants, to see at this one. Uh, thank you so much, Father Deluca. Uh, thank you so much. I'm sure a lot of uh, our audience here would like to visit and uh, really experience Christianity at uh, Nagasaki. All right. Um, again, uh, we deeply apologize to. Uh, the questions uh, we, that we cannot accommodate all the questions uh, at this moment, but we will be sending these uh, questions to Father De Luca and Dr. Herona so that later on we can answer this for you. Um, all right. So uh, with that, I will now give the floor back to Ms. Raquel Nakayam. Thanks, Trish. I hope it. I hope uh, it will not take 500 years for us to have another symposium. Once again, I would like to request Dr. Hirona and Father Lorenzo, Father Lorenzo or Lorenzo De Luca, together with Mr. Domingo Goa, Ms. Trish, 
and Ms. Cynthia Reyes to join us for a group photo of our morning session of the event. Please look to your camera. Pause for, pause for a smile. Can we do that once again? Everyone, please look to your camera. Pause for a smile. Thank you so much. At this point, we would like to call once again the President of the Philippine Federation of Japan Alumni, Ms. Cynthia Reyes, to present the Certificates of Appreciation to our keynote speakers. Thank you, Ms. Raquel. On behalf of ASCOJA, ASJA, and Filfedja, this Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Dr. Danilo Madrid Herona for sharing his time and talent as a keynote speaker at the symposium on the beginnings of European colonization at Southeast Asia held via Zoom this 16th of October 2021. Signed by the Chairman of the ASEAN Council of Japan Alumni, Mr. Yi Jen In, the President of the Philippine Federation of Japan Alumni, yours truly, and the Chairman of the Asia Japan Alumni International, Mr. Jian Yi Shen. Thank you, Dr. Herona. And now, on behalf of Ascoja, Asja, Filfeja, the Certificate of Appreciation is presented to Reverend Father Renzo De Luca for sharing his time and talent as a keynote speaker at the Symposium on the Beginnings of European Colonization of Southeast Asia, held via Zoom the 16th of October, 2021. Signed by the Chairman of ASEAN Council of Japan Alumni, Mr. Yi Jen In, the President of Philippine Federation of Japan Alumni, yours truly, and the Chairman of the Asia Japan Alumni International, Mr. Jian Yi Shen. Thank you, Father Lawrence. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Shreyas and Ms. Cynthia Reyes. That concludes the first part of today's symposium. We will pause for a break and resume at 2 p.m. Manila time for more exciting and interesting topics on Dutch, French, British colonization, and a lot more. So we hope you all stay with us. We will also be raffling off five copies of the very well-researched book of Dr. Hirona entitled Ferdinand Magellan, the Armada de Maluco, and the European Discovery of the Philippines. This book is out of stock on Amazon and a copy of it has been recently presented by the Philippine Ambassador to the Netherlands to the National Maritime Museum in Amsterdam. I'm sure you will find this book a great addition to your collection, at least for those who will win in the raffle. So be sure to be back. As actual attendance will be required for the book to be claimed by the winner. Bye for now and see you all later at 2 p.m. Manila time. Thank you once again to our keynote speakers, Dr. Hirona and Father Renzo. <laughs>